Welcome to the Great Base Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith, along with Ilya Son of a And behind the scenes, <laughs> the man who makes the podcast go, Ivan, is an idiot. It's a good company. <laughs> We'd have a great podcast. Um, Ilya, uh, take a shot at your last name. Well, I think I'll get it from the first time. Semyonov. Semyonov. And how about Ivan's last name? Ozeretz. Ozeretz. And great to have you here. Ilya and I have known each other almost 10 years. What do you think of Wintergreen? You're here for the first time. Yeah, well, first of all, again, thank me. Th thank me. <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, Wintergreen, what a beautiful place. Um, again, I'm in here right now during the winter, so it's like there is no snow and there is no leaves, but it's still beautiful. You can see a lot of uh, um, beautiful mountains, but would like to come out on here when there is snow and when there is a... Uh, we're in between, yeah, yeah. The summer is great. Like for for the courts, you feel like you're in the forest. We have twelve clay courts, three indoor hard courts. Great place. To, uh, we're going to take some players today, some coaches, run up a big hill backwards five times. Not missing out. Yeah. Well, we'll be done. We'll get you there. Oh. We'll get you there. With uh, Ilya has put down thirty two thoughts. There's a great hockey pad podcast. We don't want to plagiarize. Uh, Jeff Merrick and Elliot Friedman. 32 thoughts, but we go, before we go to 32 thoughts, um, there's a lot of plagiarizing in tennis. <laughs> we certainly like to give credit where credit's due. Um, I only have a few original ideas, few original thoughts with what language do you think we should do this? And you speak three English, Latvian, or Russian. I think for three hour podcast, let's go on three different ones, Russian, yeah. English, Latvian. Well, growing up playing ice hockey, I was introduced to profanity at a young age, so that's two languages. But we like to think that the great base is a language unto itself. Um, with, yeah, this is an isolated place. There's no distractions. But like most places in the world, this is the bad news is we still have cell phones Yeah. at Wintergreen. I will talk more about cell phones. Cell phones. Um, well, let's just, is that one of your 32? Let me see. I've got these. I've read through these. Um, why don't we just go with a number? We'll, we'll de definitely get the cell phones. Give me a number. I'll read it off. One through 32. Let's just go. Easy number. Uh, let's go 27. 27, Frank Mahavlich. Okay. Um, different levels of understanding the system. Systems and organized plan. We're a system of systems. But go ahead, comment on that. No, I just can just even comment on myself, uh, understanding systems. It's just, there's so many levels to understand it. Um, even if you're going to go online to greatbasetennis.com and you're going to go to Great Base Tennis and, uh, uh, Intelligence Supplied, the first time you're going to watch it, I feel like 95% of information just goes over your head. You're understanding what you understand. Second time you watch it, it's like, wow, I didn't hear that before. Third time you watch it, wow, there is more. And then when you're coming out and actually you're working, you know, with you, Steve, and seeing everything, it's, uh, oh, I don't know. I don't think it's weeks. It's definitely not half weeks. It's definitely not months. It's going to be years. And, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, ego. You know, uh, we all have ego. It's going to have to be, have a good ego, healthy ego. But uh, I remember the first three months that I spent with you in uh, North Carolina and Charlotte. I'm like, I think I got it. <laughs> then six months later, it's like, oh, so dumb. You don't understand anything. Then you think, okay, I got it. One year later, oh, so dumb. You don't know anything. So uh, the more you learn, I mean, right now at this point, it's like you just keep learning. You never arrive. It's just like what, what you say is uh, uh, great tennis players. They never arrive. They're always in transition to a better place. So just like the same with the coaches. Um, yeah, that's a Jim Lear quote. Because I love that. Tennis players never arrive. They're always in transit to a better place. Uh, someone we had on as, as a guest, Carla Devaro, she says, no two days are the same with training with us. I'm sure that's true with everyone. Um, Chad Berryhill was with us for five years. He tells people, you know, blink of an eye. You're, you're just here for a year. He says you need at least two years. But, you know, you have to work the information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, say, with Braden, for example, he's the cornerstone. If, if people really study Braden, or the late Vic Braden, that you can learn so much. I've told people you can learn more away from Vic Braden than with Vic Braden in one sense because 
Uh, you just, you have to go to work. The, the more you um, understand efficiency, um, sophistication and simplification, it just this makes sense and it works. Yeah. Let's go with another one. Give me a number. Yeah, let's go. Uh, let's go 15. I don't even know what's number 15, but. Uh... 15, Bobby Russo. Uh, at one time, uh, I was fortunate to go through all the details, but I was fortunate to spend a day sitting next to Jean Beliveau. He was to promote tennis and I was promote, um, he used to promote hockey. And he's a legend for those people who are younger and don't follow hockey. The great number four, Jean Beliveau. So I sat down at the table and uh, I just gave him the numbers of all his teammates. It started with one. Wow. Bobby Russo was 15. So paper charting versus phone app. Uh, then charting and developing the tennis mind. Go ahead. Yes, uh, especially with the players. I mean, the more chances you have to chart and put your brains on the, on the paper, the better. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of positives in the um, phone charting apps, but you don't really, you're just getting it very quickly, you're just getting an answer. But it's great for younger students, just first of all, if you're going to chart, you have to watch your match. Um, and then putting a math together. So the more you spend uh, time actually putting a math together, charting you, and w watching yourself on the video, um, you, you're developing a much better understanding. You start thinking in terms of stats versus score next time when, you, when you're when on the court. I mean, going back to Kobe, Kobe Bryant, I believe, uh, I don't know exactly to how many years, but he was saying four or five years he spent in a, in a room watching every every game for two, three hours with this old guy, videographer, and just watching what the people are doing in the, in the stands, what the people are doing in, in his team. Like he said, after so many years watching so many hours of the, of the tape, when he was playing on the, on, the, on the court, it felt like he's actually watching himself from the, from the side, not from the view. So I think that the video is a powerful tool. We'll, we'll actually talk about this more. There is uh, one number in here, the visuals. Um, yeah, so, but with the app, I think it's a great tool for, for coaches and a great tool for parents, you know, um, just to kind of record it and just get an answer right away. Don't get uh, hung up on emotions, but just have a fax for your, for your kid. But for the students themselves, I think the best would be charting on a piece of paper versus the, the phone. I was told um, years ago by someone who's in the computer business, retention for learning is greater if you actually write it down. Um, you know, I don't know the, the study and how that was conducted, but in listening to Ilya, certainly I just, I hear the pillars when he said brains on the paper, Jim Verdick with a clipboard, put your brains down. Mm -hmm. Um, that came up in our last podcast with Andy Durham. We said, if we visit, were to visit one's house, if junior tennis players, um, that they should be have a, a chart and they should be practicing charting matches, but just getting kids to watch, um, to watch players and study the game. You know, I, you know, on a regular basis, almost every day sitting with the tennis channel on and a junior tennis player, I said, watch how pros just hit up the middle, mm -hmm. just basically hitting up the middle, waiting for the short ball. Uh, but the chart, if you don't chart, you don't chart. You won't be very good at it. Yeah. Um, it's like anything. The more you do it, the better you become. And it's amazing. It just sounds like doom and gloom. Very few people, very few tennis players charted a match. There's so many different ways to chart. Um, let's go with another number. Yeah, we can even follow up with this. We're going to yeah, go, go with, the, with the numbers in here. Um, Go with, let's go number 22. I'm going to find the numbers here. 22, John yeah. Ferguson. Okay. Um, seek competition versus avoiding competition. I love that. Seek competition versus avoiding competition. It's amazing to me with, and I don't like the fact that young kids can look and see who's in a tournament. And now with the UTR, if Say, for example, they go into a tournament, they're the highest ranked player in the tournament. Well, I don't want to play the tournament. Uh, the Intercollegiate Tennis Association, the ITA, oh, 
so many of the backdrop matches, you know, people wouldn't show up, they wouldn't play. Mm -hmm. But seeking competition versus avoiding it, um, go ahead. Yeah, just even understanding what competition is. I mean, nowadays, I mean, um, you're just watching kids and they're totally scared. Their heart rate goes up, you know, they're forgetting to breathe. Uh, it looks like they're wearing those uh, shutters in front of them. They don't see five feet away from them what's going on. Um, and uh, in the end of it, they're just focusing on those last two seconds, what's going to happen in the end of the match. So basically, if you're going to put even the math to it, what is the percentage of the whole match that they're focusing on? Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? That's like less than 1%. Uh, but competing, I mean, you have to understand that every morning you wake up, actually, it starts when you're going to sleep. If you have a plan, you can compete. If you don't have a plan for tomorrow, you can't compete. It's just everything just goes. It's in the Russian as you look spit in the air. You're going to land like a spit somewhere on the ground and that's when you that's how you land without a plan so it's like okay i'm gonna run tomorrow i'm gonna do push-ups tomorrow in the morning so you have a plan and the competition starts tomorrow did i do it and if you don't understand that competition then if you only thinking you're coming out on the weekend and you thinking you're competing sorry that's 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 a phony competition and that's why you're only worrying about those two seconds who's going to shake your hand and who's going to be on winning or losing side um no, competition isn't everywhere. So see competition, I mean, of course, it's self-competition and then there is a, you know, group competition. And then learn how to lose first and then learn how to win. So there's so many things can go about it, but seek, seek competition, plan with, for competition. With competition, someone gets up in the morning and they're going to use a bar of soap, they hit the showers and the bar of soap has a name. And one company is competing with the next company. Toothpaste. No one has a, a tube of toothpaste. It's just a, a blank tube. It's got a name on it. Yeah, so compete. Uh, Jim, Jim Lair, I remember in the 80s, uh, many times he came to visit our program. We tried to have him there every other year. So in this two-year program, people would be exposed to Jim's work. And he had heart rate monitor. And I, I remember, I don't I haven't used it a long time, but my connection with him is that I had a heart rate monitor. In other words, we would send someone to the locker room and they would put an apparatus under their shirt. Um, and then on your wristwatch, you would know what their heart rate was. Yeah. Um, the first time he, he demonstrated that he was lecturing, we had like 150 people in the audience. Somebody who really loved tennis. I remember Dan Tony, very good, very good physician, a very good club player, and he put it on, he got so absorbed into Lair's uh, lectures, or his, his concepts and such, that he forgot that he had it on, and he said, oh, and let's do this now, uh, Dan Tony, come on down. And he just looked at his watch and what his heart rate was. Everybody gets nervous. Mm -hmm. But then it's how do you manage nervousness? Um, I think with stage fright, I think, you know, we always try to have kids, okay, tell a clean joke, tell, tell a story, sing a song. And it's amazing you know, how people get so, so uptight. I mean, going back on the heart monitor, you know, we just ran this morning a beep test. And of course, we can push the kids, you know, you have to beat your record, get and be close to your record. But it would be great, actually, with a heart monitor. It's like you show up for practice. If you cannot push yourself to a max and heart monitor, not, and that doesn't even matter what's going to be your record running a beep test. But if you can push yourself, you're ready to work. Okay, you're ready to practice. But if your heart beat doesn't even go past, you know, 70%, you're at 60% and you're acting up and you're showing everybody that you're hurt and you cannot do it, it's like, sorry, you're not ready. I mean, your heart would go up. Even if you're injured, your heart still would go up to, to a maximum. You, of course, your score in a beep test is going to be lower, but you tell everybody, I'm here to work. I think this is this this is a great ticket to practice. You deserve practice. Ilya is from Lafayette. Number one sport in Lafayette now is hockey. His brother, um, Nils, I mean, he skates really well. I've seen him seen him on uh, film sk skating. Hockey. My oldest brother was in Russia, and I remember coming back and saying it was the first time he'd ever seen athletes. You know, they take off the hockey glove and they take the index finger and they put it on the carotid pulse and they're see how hard they work mm -hmm. um yeah that's not something that we uh are part of so much in junior tennis yeah but pushing yourself um you know jim jim verdict uh just try to be one percent better 
and I think that's it's not um, hating to lose and loving to win. It's just learning to compete. Okay, thirty-two thoughts. What do you got? Let's go. Number seven, lucky seven. Howie Morenz, that number has been was retired a long time. Five E's of player development. You have enjoyment, not hit and giggle. You have education, which is too many times missing, especially when it comes to ball striking. So enjoyment, education, experience, environment exposure. Go ahead. Yes, uh, well, out of those five, I mean, education is one. But if you're going to look at all of this, you know, the ed education, uh, you know, sometimes when people come to Great Bays, they're thinking, oh, it's all about the technique. And it's like, no, if you're going to, again, the level of understanding, if you're understanding, uh, you will see that it's the smallest part to it. Um, I would like to talk about exposure. What are you exposed to in tennis? Are you exposed to a local level? You're just fighting for that little trophy for the local players and you just don't want to lose to anybody else. You don't see further. Is it national level? Is it international level? Um, so it's, you have to open up your bubble. Don't get stuck. Um, then it's exposure to different sports. You know, tennis players, they're not exposed to other sports. I mean, you're, they're lucky if they came from a basketball or baseball or if they're still doing it, ice hockey. You know, uh, exposure to the work ethic, you know, um, even just like uh, martial arts, just being exposed to this. Yeah, you can get kicked, you know, boxing. If you don't do this, <laughs> you're getting right in the ringer. <laughs> um, um, in, team, in team tennis, understanding if you don't do what the coach tells you, uh, that's being exposed to other sports. If you don't do what the coach tells you, you're not going to even experience winning or losing. You're just going to be on the bench. So exposure to all of those things. I mean, there are so many intangibles that come in to becoming a great tennis player. Um, and again, environment is going to tie in back to a competition. Are you in a competitive environment? That goes back to at home. It's great if you have siblings. You know, if you have five siblings, that's natural competitiveness. You're competing for cookies. Yeah, <laughs> even the cookie is a sugar, but you're competing for it. Um, you know, environment in the club, environment with your coach. Um, you know, um, we're going to touch base about Russian former like the cultural toughness. Um, yeah, so um, environment exposure, um, you have to find the ways to put yourself in a great environment. But if not, I mean, what is environment in your head? No, that's, is, yeah, that's a good point. Between your ears, that's what's going on. You know, one should be able to change their environment. Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, say you're practicing with a you know, a dozen players, it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be the hardest worker in this group and I'm going to lift, lift the level of the group. Yeah. This is a tennis podcast, but going back to hockey back in the day, I was born in 1954 house hockey was Saturday mornings. Travel hockey was only Sunday and there was not that many travel teams. Then we got to the point where it was, became political and parents wanted to create their own travel teams. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, again, hockey, the, uh, NCAs, this town, I am born in Potsdam, New York, Clarkson university. The women are knocking on the door again. They've won the NCAs, I think three times, but if you take a remote control and you watch an NCAA hockey and then you go to NHL hockey, it looks like the college players are skating and they're very, very good, but it looks like they're skating in quicksand. Yeah. The speed of the game, you know, and that's what happens in in tennis. It's it's a mistake's a mistake, but it's the speed of the game that changes. And I do think that people need to see it up close and personal. I think uh, children who aspire, the goal is to play college tennis. The parents, they'd be so much better off to skip a few weekends of not going to tournaments and going to watch college tennis. Billie Jean King, you got to see it to to be it. You got to see it to believe it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, one's lens. I remember uh, working with Vince Spadia. He was already a, a great player. Along with Dave Anderson, we're working with him and he was hitting with Robbie Seguso. So you have a kid who won the Orange Bowl, got to be 19 in the world. And you know he was certainly better in the backcourt. Where Seguso, he was number one in the world for five years. But just to watch them hit a tennis ball. And I know Robbie, it was short lived, but I was running his tennis academy and he didn't want players being filmed where they were being fed a ball. Mm -hmm. He wanted it to be a live hit. Um, with, uh, yeah, the, the, the five E's, 
um, with, with education, and I'm, I'm glad you said that technique is just a very small part of it. You know, the, the, how you live your life. Do you live your life to win? The attitude of the household. Uh, so it's, you know, it's character 101, gym layer, character muscle. But yeah, the, the five E's of player development, it's not hit and giggle enjoyment. You know, you got to love the process and you got to get to the point. It's like today, you know, the, the kids come in and they see the cone set up and they just know that we're going to run the beep test. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was teasing everyone and said, yeah, you know, it's, we start practice at 7 a.m. And how many people would rather be sleeping right now? Yeah, come on. I mean, I can put my head back on the pillow. Sugar, let's go with uh, some pastries. Get the cinnamon rolls out. You know, who would like to, you know, sugar, sleep and sugar. This one little kid from Toronto raises his hand. I'd go for that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's like Larry Bird said, you know, no one wants to do it. A great basketball player, legendary. Is that, but you just know you got to do it. Um, share this story often. I ask juniors, who's the best player you've ever practiced with? Who's the best player you've ever seen play in person? And this is where I'm sure come up in the podcast, but it, these stories are good to hear again. Is Shane Vincent, who Dave Anderson sent him out to our place, and he uh, said, Roger Federer. Mm -hmm. Okay, we started walking backwards. Okay, that's, that's a little bit different. Another 32 thoughts. Give us a number. I was good with a number 10. I know it's a, a lot in here. We can work from 10 all the way to 12 here. Guy Lafleur. Visuals. Tennis court is three times longer than is wide. The word pitcher method. Um, with, for example, the Ferris wheel versus the merry-go-round mm -hmm. images. And we talk about a, a tough fighter. Um, one of the, one of the players, um, um, we, um, had him on TV, uh, not TV on our, you had him on TV. You can explain that. We put it up on, on Facebook, but yeah, go through the visuals. That's good. Yeah. Um, like, like Mylan, um, it's, you know, if I say orange, maybe you see orange differently. So if you don't, if I don't know that you see orange different, nobody will be able to coach you actually to tell how you see orange than I do. But um, uh, tennis court is three times longer than it's wide. When you're saying it, you know, it makes sense three times longer than it's wide. But when you're going to put it on a piece of paper, it's like, whoa, that's, that's a rectangle. <laughs> okay, there is no angles. Um, so sometimes the brain needs to do this um, visually. Again, myelin is being form the new visual cortex. That's when it starts making sense. Um, you know, that's when you can put, you know, dimensions of the court, and physical laws dictating stroke production, no coach's opinion or any unique theory. And uh, sometimes for the new students who come to my small program in Orlando, I put it on a, on a, on a, on a screen. I put four, rec uh, three rectangles. One is a little bit wider. And I say, okay, tell me, when do you see a tennis court? But there's no lines, it's just rectangular. And they're right away telling me, this is a tennis court, and it's the widest one. Then I show the second one, which is much narrower. And then I show the third one, that's really narrow. And then I show them the answer, the, the narrowest one is a tennis court. And they're like, there's no way. <laughs> but then I show them the picture from the top, uh, like, a, like a picture of the drone right on top of the net. And I'm taking down the, taking off the doubles alleys. And you see people rallying from sides, like from, the, from behind the baseline. And you just see how narrow it is. Um, and then brain starts making adjustments right away. And that's when, um, I like this test when we're walking out on the court and we're saying, okay, now go with your racket pointing down the line with your racket. Now close your eyes and point cross court. And this is where, how your brain sees the court. You know, when you're making a shot, it's, if your brain sees the court is gigantic and wide, your brain's going to make that quick formula, quick decision. And most of the times when kids are pointing cross court, they're pointing to the net post on the left side. So if your brain sees a court like this, then yes, and your brain is going to calculation wise, it's going to make sense that you can pull across. It's going to make more sense to hit as a merry-go-round versus Ferris wheel. But then it's great. Okay. You're coming out to doubles alley and it's like, okay, doubles alley we're in Las Vegas. Now where you don't want to miss the ball right away is saying, we don't want to miss the ball wide. But when you're standing on the tennis court, because it's a little bit of optical illusion, they're saying, well, net, you know, for the most part, but when you're standing doubles alley, you know, and then understanding, okay, this is going to be a first full swing versus this. So, um, and that's why it's so important to go through the numbers in the court, dimensions of the court. Because sometimes when I start with a new students too, and I'm showing them all the dimensions, they're like, oh, this is boring. And then you're putting, no, this, 
when you start putting it together, it's going to help your technique. It's going to help your brain to create a formula. Basically, the strokes are a formula. You know, you want to have efficient formula to solve the problem. You know, when you go about spins, when you go about speed. Um, so, and that's where I work with your me uh, method as well on the serve. You know, you're trying to connect through other sports or, um, um, you know, like a baseball player taking the ball out of the glove. So your brain makes easier calculations. Um, I believe, I, I feel, I guess, I believe the serve is tougher to teach out of all the shots. Mm -hmm. That is the serve, and it's easier with the word picture method to show that. Um, so it's just, uh, it's great to to use word picture methods to explain the court strokes, to relate to the student world who hasn't been around, uh, again, different levels of understanding to show the picture. Um, and then we talked about the images of a fighter when you talk to a student, it's like, hey, if the kid never watched the Rocky or any, or read some books about true fighters and you talk to him, okay, what is it, your fighter image? And if he has like some cartoon image of a fighter, I'm sorry, we're not talking the same in the same lines. So that's why it's again, reading books, I mean, watching the, 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 the movies, I mean, just to have that, um, inner image. Um, and then the third part I have in here, um, Again, creating a blueprint of your swing. So having a confidence that in your head, you want to see, you want to believe that you can make a shot. So what we did was one of the students, um, we recorded, I mean, it was a long session. We just recorded the best shots that he can hit. And it was some combinations. His approach shot volley, his grand strokes, we recorded on the side, we recorded on the back, how he makes a contact. We recorded from the top, how he's going through the tiebreaker test and he's completing tiebreaker test. And then we pick the best shots and we put it on the loop. So for example, he's just going to hit right now 20 shots in a row, the same shot. And he just watches it. He just watches it. So his brain just recognizes it and he has that image that I can do it. Um, so just again, seeing that's why it's so important to have this, uh, seeing yourself in the video, seeing yourself in the mirror, it's out of body experience. You want to see yourself. Okay. That's, that's how it looks like I can press a button and I can execute. I don't have to, um, um, figure it out in the middle of the stress point. So again, visuals, just visuals and learning. I, I, I feel it's helping me out to relate to newer students and even students who are, uh, you know, a couple of things, uh, vocabulary. One time I traveled to work at an academy and they had 50 words and they periodic periodically would change one word, but it was 50 was the limit. Uh, you just use the word gigantic, uh, that comes from Vic Braden's book, obviously. Uh, it's not a unique word by any means, but Vic would just say people think the tennis court's gigantic, and it's not. Um, another word you use was formula. Welby Van Horn is, and it's true, is that he had a successful formula. It was, you know, balance, grip, swing, body. Mm -hmm. You know, Welby was funny. He, when he, he refused to talk to people about strategy. I'm not going to talk to you about strategy until you have strokes. Yeah. With uh, Tim May, I, his coach at Sanford, Dick Gould, uh, with body language and, you know, editing and saying, okay, this is what you want to look like. He showed him film of himself. So the, with the young player's name is Benjo, his first name, and he, um, in the garage, it's a full-size screen. And, yeah, we'll put a projector right in front of it, so it's pretty much full-size body. I think there's a lot to be said. Is uh, And I think, you know, he's a much better tennis player than he allows himself to be. Um, you know, we, I think we all – know that tennis players have to have less and less self-doubt. But I think it's very powerful that when you're, you know, he's doing a footwork and a, a dynamic balance mm -hmm. routine. It's, it's not static balance, but he's doing it to his own image. Yeah. I think that's very powerful. Yeah. So with, with uh, coming back to the tennis court, um, not that often, certainly on television, but uh, just recently, I did a workshop at North Carolina State. And indoors, they have one court that has no alleys. And Dave Secker is a great place for them to practice their doubles. So it's more to the middle, to the middle. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, We have a lot of players come here from uh, Miron Mann, who, who's now running the club that Richard Hernandez ran for decades. And they have one court with um, n just no alleys. And it really, really helps people out. Um, with, uh, but this, most people don't have that experience to realize how, how, court, how narrow the court really is. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, 32 thoughts. Give us another one. Well, let's go down to 11. It's kind of related. Role models and idols. Um, you know, sense of belonging. Uh, believing in yourself. If you don't believe it, nobody will. Um, you have to have role models. You have, again, idols. But if you have idols, you do not want to have a wow factor. Again, an idol, but again, um, um, in the end, I'm, I'm going to try to be I'm going to try to be better. Um, but that's why, again, you're going back to books, you're reading biographies, and you're trying to learn why they're the best, trying to find out the backstories of each player, each successful player. It doesn't have to be even tennis, but just an athlete, role models in different sports. Um, again, if you want to be goal-oriented, successful uh, tennis player. Um, yeah, so that's, um, I think, uh, I believe it's powerful um, to have that. If you don't have that, again, going back to a fighter image, what would Roger do? You know, like, they have those bracelets. But like, what would Jesus do? Oh, they have to have a bracelet. What would Roger do? That's good. <laughs> oh, that fighter image, going back to that, my father used to, uh, you, know, you know, some of the... You know, the kids be, oh, it's so hot, whatever, and that. People would be complaining. He said, hey, what you need to do is just go back to the high school, in the back of the high school, and watch the football players in August doing double sessions with pads. I mean, it gets hot everywhere by August. With, But you said a, a, a phrase, sense of belonging. That's so huge. Everyone belongs if they have a great work ethic. You will be welcomed with open arms if you're the hardest worker. Say someone... Uh, is going off to college, they're going to be a freshman. They just show up and they don't worry about what their teammates think. It's like uh, Jerry Rice when he came, I'm going to guess it was Southern Mississippi and he's drafted by the 49ers. He goes down and out, runs a route, quarterback throws the ball to him, Joe Montana, I think, Steve Steve Young. And he catches the ball and he turns and sprints to the end zone. And all the, everybody's kind of looking at who's this guy? And he, he did it every time. You know, catch the ball, run a sprint, catch the ball, run a sprint. Um, you know, both my boys, especially my youngest son, he spent quite a bit of time in Sweden training. And the players hang around the players. Um, at this one club in, in uh, Vexho is, you know, Stefan Edberg's retired. But he's hanging out with the juniors. He's coming and hitting with the juniors, just loves tennis. And that is, I think it's very difficult for American kid versus it one of these kids from a small European country because they get exposure. Um, but yeah, I think of that, you know, you want to, you want to be long, you show up and you're Charlie hustle. It's the kid you show up and you were the hardest kid, hardest working kid there. And you have the best attitude. You, even if you're a newcomer and your skill levels, you're, it's, you're an inferior player as far as skill. Um, but no, it's very, very good to hear that phrase sense of belonging because um, once you have that, you're on your way. You know, I, I, I belong. There's going to be room for room for me at the top. Yeah. Go again. Number. Let's go to the next one on this one. Twelve. Oh, I love this one. Uh, Jim Lair. He's one of our pillars. Written 17 books. Uh, storytelling for mental toughness. Everything turns into a story. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, it's like how, how, how do you talk to yourself? What is what is a voice in there? You again. How do you respond to the mistakes? How do you respond to things not going your way? I mean, you were the one who were deciding was some that was a something bad happened, or it's actually you can take a lesson out of it. I mean, are you responding like a victim? Or are you responding like a a fighter? You know. Um, again, what is a victim? The one who blames and the one who finds excuses. So it's like as soon as you feel like you're blaming or excuse, you're finding excuses for yourself, you're a victim. You're not in the right way. So it's a fighter. I'm going to find a way. I got this. Um, again, just uh, the losses, for example, you're losing. Are you putting it under the under the rug or um, are you trying to get a lesson from your loss? Um, are you overly excited about just a win or are you just going to go back? And again, if somebody charted you or somebody um, recorded you, okay, how can I improve? Um, and again, it's going back to sense of belonging too. really seeing yourself that, um, and again, having attachment to it. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about it too, you know, future versus past. I mean, you want to really spend some time seeing yourself that you want to be that. And again, the phones are taking away the time from that as well. See, uh, daydreaming and picturing, uh, analyzing even how did you do a practice? I mean, how many kids are, 
um, getting in the car and really analyzing the practice, just going in their head, just mentally, not even in a journal, but just, okay, I should have done that. Oh, and now a 10 year old has a phone. I realize the kid has to have a phone logistics, you know, calling your mom, your dad up. Okay. Um, you know, I need to be picked up at four thirty, such and such. Yeah. We, we, we need to just take one, one of these numbers, the phone, but, uh, the inner voice, uh, added to that, um, mm -hmm. no one will ever hear your inner voice. Your inner voice is everything. Uh, victim or survivor. I like to take that and say, okay, let's put in two other words. Uh, but just with victim and survivor, the, the helicopter parent is really a submarine parent. The helicopter parent comes to the rescue, and every time they come to the rescue, the, uh, the victim becomes weaker and weaker. And that's why we say submarine. They just take them further and further down. But you can have a rainy day session, a, a classroom follow-up. It's just, okay, let's go with other, two other words. You know, soft, hard, mm -hmm. um, you know, just positive, negative, like with the attitude. With, I think people have all heard that. So there's the jaw bone, there's a funny bone, there's a knuckle bone, there's a wish bone, and there's the backbone. And yeah, it's so easy to just talk about it, be the jaw bone. It's so easy to fantasize and wish, it, wish, to, wish to be a player. We're always saying, don't have wishful hopeful thinking, make it happen. You know, the, the complainer is just knocking that and everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, uh, the backbone, um, so, so important. Go ahead. Um, let's go with a deep training. Uh, number, number 16. Number 16. Number 16, the pocket rocket. Um, Richard, Henri Richard, deep training, the talent code, Daniel Coyle's book, the talent code. He has a second, he has the book, uh, the cultural code, but he also has the little book of talent. We tell people, parents, coaches, players, they should have that little book of talent in their shoulder bag. That should be a must. But, um, well, we talk about the talent code all the time. Parents should make the, make the classroom or excuse me, make the car a classroom and, and every kid should listen to that tape certainly more than once. Mm -hmm. right. But uh, the, just, just the one, one, one part from this book, it's a deep training, how to stay switched on, have your brain being switched on. It's, uh, you know, there was like a little example, a little graph, how many words you're going to remember. There was uh, on one graph, there was just words regularly. And then another side of the graph, there were words with a couple letters missing. Um, and then they're giving you time after like two minutes, how many words can you remember? And you remember more words from the table that the letter was missing because your brain is trying to make a little calculation like, okay, so you're spending more brain energy to put it in when you're reading a word, you know, trying to figure out which letter goes in here. So that's a deep training. So sometimes I do that with the, with the kids as well. I say, okay. To explain it, what is a deep training? I give them a simple arithmetic problem. Let's say 13 plus 32. And I'm like, don't even give me an answer. Then I ask them, so what happened? What, how did you figure out then the, the answer? It's like, well, you have to visualize it. You have to divide it or uh, subtract. So in your head, you have a visual. So the same thing when you are reading a book. If you're reading a book that you like, every sentence that you read, you're not really reading words. You almost have a visual. You know, you're almost you're in the book. If you're reading a book that you don't really like, sometimes if you're not focusing, you feel like you're just reading words, and you can read a whole page, and it's like, what was that? Yeah, we've I think we've all done that with that going back to a subject that you really weren't interested in. Yeah, and you just have to go back and go back, and you just I mean, I need a grade, so you're just forcing yourself. But the books that you like reading, I uh, mean, it's just every sense you read, you just you in there. Um, you're not trying to again type um, brain typing sensei versus intuitive you're not trying to figure out what's going in a few like what's going to be happening next you're like in the moment you're reading here so so the same with with the with the, with the training and technique you know especially a lot of players are checking out when they're working on technique shadow swinging or drop hitting balls or i mean even just rallying i mean creating making little discoveries when you're just rallying it's it's almost you visually you're not reading a book you're writing a book you're writing your own story so you have to be all switched on. Okay, so my elbows up and you have to be talking, seeing visuals, again, going back to imagery. When you're doing, we're all the time telling students 
on the serve, you have to have a piece of paper next to the mirror word picture method. It's your poem. <laughs> um, and then when you learning this way and you see all those little points, um, you're, you're connecting much better and uh, you know, your brain gets puts puzzle pieces much faster. So that's deep training and we can even follow up to metronome training after this. We could see how people are. Yeah, let, let's, let, are. Let, let's do that next. But on, on this one, uh, connecting, that, that's one thing is uh, people just disconnect when they turn the cell phone on right away. And, you know, kids that are not part of an intense program during the water break, they're, they're checking their phone. I mean, it's a major crisis. Uh, Tim Galloway, best-selling book ever, The Inner Game. First, he was, it was with tennis, and then he certainly went on to inner golf and inner life. And um, but with concentration, I love how Galloway, I was fortunate enough to go to one of his clinics in the 70s, is that you don't have to slap yourself. And you're in a movie, for example, like you mentioned reading a book, you're just connected, you're just absorbed into the book, into the movie. You don't slap yourself in the thigh and say, right in the middle of the movie, come on, concentrate. Yeah. And actually, you know, it sounds like we're beating up young people, but. Um, I had been around kids since I was a kid, and now what happens is kids will watch a movie, but they they're they're, they're going to look at their phone while they watch the movie, mm -hmm. and they're they're just not going to get as much out of it. Total focus, T I P tip ten a total in, intense practice. Someone gives you a tip, um, I think in that sense kids are overcoached. I think before where you got one private lesson a week, like I'm hanging on to every word. Uh, I think this is something, something to add as well. Private coaches, this is junior tennis, private coaches and parents face the same problems. There's really no consequences. Where the team coach can put you on the bench. Like, I'm listening to this person. This person, I mean, college tennis is a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Like, you will play, you will not play. Yeah. And then junior, I think the parents and the juniors don't realize, well, mom and dad will take care of everything. It doesn't work that way. In junior tennis, they can find a tournament for you. There's just there's one for every level, but college tennis doesn't work that way. Um, let's let's take one commercial break here for a second. Uh, we talk about fundraising so little. We do have a website where you can donate. Rate based tennis, giving out all sorts of free educational content. But we won't do this. But what we could do if we were to raise some money is get a little table that's a little sturdier, solid oak. So we have to make sure that. We're not making too much noise because Yvonne has to do the editing so people can hear our, our uh, content. So you and I need to not rattle this table. It might fall over. Solid Oak. All right. You go to Metrodome now. What number is that? 17. 17. Jean Guy Talbot just recently passed away. Age 91. Won many Stanley Cups. I met him. Uh, one of my brothers was the assistant coach of the New York Rangers when he was the head coach. Going with the Montreal Canadiens, Hockey Night in Canada, Metrodome. This is a great addition that Ilya's made to our program. Why don't you, it, and you were a guest before and you talked about it, but let's uh, review this. Yeah, just a quick review about Metronome. Um, it's, uh, basically, we broke down uh, each shot in different increments, um, different checkpoints. You know, the volley would have three parts, ready position, turn, and contact. A grand stroke will have seven parts. Serve will have six, underspin will have five, overhead will have six. And um, and the metronome we can put, for example, if we're working on the volleys, we can put, okay, there's just going to be uh, three numbers and the metronome just going to go like 40, 40 beats per minute. One, two, three. One, two, three. And the great part about the metronome is that it's, if I would be saying it, there is some emotion involved, <laughs> you know, I can stop sometime, but metronome is just like, it just goes. And the players where they're standing, they have to all the time get into a number. So for example, if it's one, they have to be in ready position. Two, they have to turn. Three, they have to make a contact. Um, and it's great, actually, you could see which kid has a light bulb on, who is switched on, who is switched off, especially if we're working on the ground stroke, seven parts you know, breaking down, mastering the checkpoints. And if we'll see that the kid is like putting his racket in the checkpoint according to a number, I'm like, okay, he is in his own world right now. He is not with us. He left us. Yeah. Like everybody stops. <laughs> the light's on, but nobody's home. Yeah. 
Um, and then with the metronome, I mean, of course, the ground strokes, the two part swing, and we build up from seven checkpoints, we're going to five, so we're connecting the dots, then we're going to four by adding a breathing into a ground stroke. Then we're going to three parts where you're adding some footwork to it, and you have to actually hit number three, put it on your racket. It's the same thing with the volleys. I mean, we can put everybody back after they did the, all the routines with three parts, then we connect it to two parts, and then the one part, I just, I don't even put a number, I just put a bell and players are starting on the baseline and they're just moving in and they're trying to put a bell right where the contact's supposed to be. So they're going like one, 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 keep moving forward and the rack and the bell needs to hit right on the strings. So that just gives them, and it's, it's um, gives them more focused. And um, what I tell some, especially to the new students who are starting with us, I, sh I can show them through the metronome of their developmental pathway, where do they stand? I had to tell them first, look, in the beginning, the first week, I mean, you could not even shadow swing it correctly. It was three steps. Like a couple of days later, you can shadow swing it two steps. But then when you go into one, your technique was breaking down. And I tell them, like, now you cannot even shadow swing the right way without a ball. What do you think is going to happen with a ball? So they can see, like, a little pathway. Okay, I need to spend more time shadow swing in front of the mirror. I need to have it more um, automatic. Um, and then you can do even different... Um, different um, uh, situational drills, like we're going with a metronome. And then at the same time, when the, the group of kids are doing this, I can change the pace of the metronome. I can go from 45 beats per minute to 65, and I could see who is adjusting just to see if they switched on. Because it's easy to just to get in the rhythm and just keep doing, but I would switch it. And that way it shows me, okay, who is aware, who is switched on. Um, so I, 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 I feel like it's a great training again, just to, um, zero everybody in and the thing is actually when, when i do it with a metronome the training could be going they could be shattered for two hours and everybody would be switched on for some reason that when you're using technology like technology does not have emotion so they cannot really manipulate you you know it just goes um so um and um actually we just posted the video of all the different routines on the metronome online as well if somebody's interested that we can give some uh links as well Oh, we can go through that. Um, Metrodome, it'd be great to share that so people get a visual on it. Uh, a dad who, a quarterback all the way from Pop Warner to freshman, I guess maybe junior high, freshman, senior in high school, to college. Uh, he saw you do the Metrodome for the first time and he loved it. He said, people should do this every day. But you just think about it like a quarterback taking the snap, taking back the crossover steps. Oh, they have both hands on the football. It looks exactly like they're going back for an overhead. Uh, a side comment to that, we don't today here in the US of A use other sports. I mean, as we've said, people, tennis kids aren't even watching tennis, but they're not watching other sports. They're watching whatever they want on the telephone, the, the TV in their, there's a TV in their pocket with, um, and, and this, his dad, along with the mom, they brought the daughter along. She's won some national titles. There's an article on our website on why do people change coaches so much. And one thing, it's, it's the most, it's the well, most well-read article that we've had. It's been published in many, many languages and in many magazines. Um, and I basically write that if, when tennis parents talk to other tennis parents, you really should just talk to someone who's been, their child has been down the road and they're very, very successful. Like who's the smartest person at a 10 and under tournament? Mm -hmm. The person whose child wins the 10 and under tournament. The word loco in, uh, means crazy in Spanish and locals talk to locals. <laughs> they go loco. Um, along the lines of, uh, you know, the, um, the, the lights on but nobody's home. The elevator doesn't reach the top floor. You know, the, the name of a vacuum cleaner, Hoover. That kid's a Hoover head. Well, it's not politically correct to uh, get on kids' cases for not being focused. But one of my favorite quotes is um, Thomas Jefferson. Man uses 10% of their mind 10% of the time. And, you know, again, people, when you say, okay, let's slowly shadow swing the serve, just do it to a six count. Mm -hmm. And... You know, they're just so fast and going through it. Like, um, they're, 
an expression that one of our parents used, I just love it, is that's not a switched on kid. So they're growing myelin at a slower rate. And they know the, the metrodome clearly shows that. Are, are they into it? And, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about boredom. To be bored is to insult one's own intelligence. If you're bored, you're boring. Poor reflection upon yourself. Okay, 32 thoughts. Give us another one. Let's go number one. Number one. Maybe that's Rogi Vashon. Um, DMP, under two minutes, shadow swinging, static balance, and dynamic balance, and a bit of fitness. Um, daily monitoring program. I know we uh, came up with this. We put it up once. We took it down, improved upon it. I know we took it down during COVID because uh, so many coaches were, you know, really struggling and they're just, they're trying to make their living teaching remotely. But why don't you talk a little about DMP? We got to relaunch that. We've been talking to uh, Sophia Patel is going to help us out, you know, network coordinator. Uh, one thought that comes to me is that we really wanted to have the older kids pull the younger kids and not be selfish and do, do it every day. Because we do have, um, especially here in, in America, we have a, a long list of coaches that uh, are using, excuse me, using the system that we put together. But DMP, make a few comments on that, please. Yes. Um, well, the last time where uh, we came up with this great, um, there is a video of you actually going over the two minutes. It's a great format. It's, uh, it's basically, there's no excuse for the kid not to record two minutes, static balance, 48 second drills and doing dynamically and then just choose out of eight drills and just do 10 sets, like 10 push-ups, 10 setups, 10 lunges or 10 squats. Um, and just record it and post it on this um, um, private, I would say, private networks that only people who are in the program can see you. And it's so powerful. First of all, I mean, uh, I know that there were some coaches that were if you didn't do DMP, you're not allowed to practice. It just gives a little bit of responsibility. Yeah, Steve Roberts was doing that. Yes, and start using that as well in, in our, just to give a little bit of responsibility, a little, give a little discipline to a, to a student. So like, are you thinking about tennis when you're at home or you're just putting it under the bed? Just that idea that you're thinking about it needs to be done. You know, it's like, and then, you know, you're communicating to the parents. No, just, and to the parents is like, you're trying to tell, don't tell them. If they didn't do it tonight, let them fail. Let them have a mistake. Don't let them come to practice. Like make it important. Um, and then after this, it's like okay, so you see it. Um, but the parents have to understand. Say, for example, if someone spends years with us, start the course, stay the course. If they don't do it, and let's get right down to it, most kids are good kids. If they don't do it, you're you're playing with their psyche. If they don't do it, they're not going to be confident. Yeah. They've been told to do it. They're not doing it. Sorry, Charlie. And that other cultures, um, you know, is more demanding. Kids are going to do it. Yeah. That's, but that's where it's, tennis being a, an individual sport team, you know, the acronym together, everyone accomplishes more. But it, it's, um, it's so powerful. And then the kids that have done it have really improved. I know some parents, uh, they haven't necessarily done it through DMP, but they've just done it on their own. We're there every day for two minutes. Get a, tr get a tripod, get a camera and have your child do it you're really busy um you know most um goal-oriented tennis players the juniors they just have their academic work and their extracurricular pursuit which is tennis so they you know two minutes is nothing mm -hmm. um but yeah go ahead and then it's, when it becomes a habit it's basically becoming like brushing your teeth like we have some students in here who have passed three months every day in a row. So it's just, it just becomes part of the routine. It's becoming part of the lifestyle in a way. You have to do this. Uh, I know there were stories, especially during COVID, some coaches uh, who met some students uh, just for assessment. And then you know, lockdown happened and they see the, the students after four or five months not seeing them. And they were in DMP and they come back. And, like, and then the wow factor is like, wow, you guys like were taking lessons, but they were just posting the DMP every day during COVID. I um, believe it was uh, Cole, Cole Reeves. There were some stories from him like that, um, that students that he didn't teach at all, but they came back and they knew everything inside and out. Yeah, um, that's another coach, Steve Roberts, Cole, Cole Reeves, uh, young coaches that have done an excellent job. It proofs in the pudding. You just have to watch your students hit the ball. And you, like I talked to Andy Fitzell today, uh, it just takes one or two hits and you can tell if a kid, kid hits the ball efficiently. Yeah. 
Then another powerful tool is, you know, we have some, I'm sure there's a lot of students like this that don't have a coach. It's just a parent teaching kids and it's just like two of them or one of them. And it's uh, if they own DMP, it's such a powerful tool when the kids are uploading it, they see other kids from the program that are doing the same thing across US or across the world. And they feel like they're part of the big group. It's not just the father telling them to do this. They see it. Wow, there's other people doing the peer. Yeah, that's the whole goal behind uh, you know, make tennis more accessible and where it's less costly. Um, you know, really, the coach um, is the compass, should be the compass. They're giving out directions. So you follow directions. Well, the directions is you do this for two minutes. Um, Kobe Bryant, you know, we put up a Facebook post most in the last week or so about Kobe is that he's being interviewed at four in the morning and you know the guy goes you just know all these basic basic exercises you're the best basketball player in the world why do you do these basic <laughs> exercises and you know the story it should never get old and because people hear it well did you, you know um you just have to do the ordinary and extraordinary amount of times mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 there's no magic wand there's no no magic pill to get better um what else you got dmp so that needs to be um relaunched um but ba basically it's just getting in front of a mirror i think you've said many things one is uh, but even people will turn that around as you see a group of people doing it working on fundamentals just like the quarterback where you can see you know there's a depth chart of five quarterbacks and there's one quarterback uh, the dad told me uh, best thing ever happened to Tom Brady when he was in Michigan. He never knew he was going to be the starter. Hungry dog hunts best, and you just keep trying to get better. There is one quarterback I should be able to tell you his name. He never took a snap. He played for USC, but he never played. He never took a snap, but he became a starter in the NFL. That uh, the critics will look at that and go, "Y'all, you're teaching everyone the same." Yeah, it's like the alphabet. It's like the numerical system. But there will always be the individualities. The st strength will always come out. But it's, it's amazing. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is, you know, the teenager, they just become too cool for school. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing, too, is that with telephones, and that's come up a half dozen times already, the telephone makes the kid passive. The telephone makes the kid parents passive. Because, you know, my father used to yell out, you know, what, like every day, you know, the weather where we grew up was lousy. The house is not a gymnasium. This house is not a gymnasium because we would be just trying to have some fun doing something. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, I mean, kids are just pushing their thumbs. Yeah. They're pushing their thumbs. And it, it's really, it's, it's a disease. It's really, if you want your kid to be an athlete, it is a major, major problem. And All right, go ahead. Just to follow up on this one more thing. I mean, it's, uh, we just talked about the deep training. That's those two minutes. Actually, those two minutes can turn into a half an hour. The way they're recording the video and posting for everybody else when they know that all the other kids in the program can see them. So they're making sure they look good. So yeah. it's like re-record it. I want to do it again. Coming back to all these points tying in together, but Daniel Coyle, you know, he writes about the, the Mia Hamm story. Champions are made when no one's watching. Bent over the waist, gasping for air, dripping in sweat. That... You want to be authentic. You don't want to be a phony. In other words, it, we know so many kids that they hit the ball much better when we do a technical, the camera's pointing and they do a technical review. And yeah. I just tell them, you phony, you don't hit the ball that way. <laughs> and then you know, I mean, times will go, no, no, let's let's not even look at this tape because they know how to do it, but they don't do it. Let, let's show, show them the tape that they use when they play. Mm -hmm. um, okay, working along, 32 thoughts. All right. Um, Jeff Merrick. Let's go number six. Elliot Friedman. Number six, Ralph Backstrom. You're quick for those. <laughs> it's th three. Yes, passion. I had passion. All, I'm, a, I'm a transfer addict. I was hooked on hockey, and I took that passion and addressed it towards tennis. Education, exercise, enjoyment. Mm -hmm. I like the word enjoyment better than entertainment, but yeah. I think many people are looking for entertainment. And I know as a tennis teacher, it's, it's okay. Can we be clever and camouflage the education? We're teaching them, but we're not really. It's okay. Call everybody in. It's 
talk to him short and sweet and put him right back out to work, but get the messages out. But yeah, can, why don't you comment on the, the three E's? No, three E's, I mean, that's what's, uh, I mean, of course you have to have education, you know, but uh, then in the end it just becomes art of a, of, a, of a class, you know, even going to the parents. Okay, you can shadow swing five minutes, go do fitness for five minutes, you know, backboard, jump rope. Um, you know, in the court, you, you can even go compete, go play baseball, tennis, go play soccer. You know, that's entertainment and fitness at the same time. Um, you know, I mean, imagination is greater than knowledge, but you're trying to mix it in. I mean, if you don't have any education in a, in a lesson, I mean, that's just not a lesson. That's again, what, it's just going to be an activity. Um, that's for the parents to watch out too. Okay, what is my kid is learning? If it's, there's no education, just entertainment, or enjoyment and exercise, that's an activity. Then you should have just bring a kid to gymnastics, to track or to soccer. That's going to be the same. Um, but then at the same time, if there's just an education, um, again, the brain, I mean, you want to keep the brain switched on and it's amazing. The dopamine in the brain, when you sweat, the brain releases dopamine, you feel happy, you know, and at the same time, so if you let somebody work out, even if they don't like it, but if they sweat, dopamine is releasing and you can come back to, you know, learning a technique and doing what the kid would say, fundamentals, fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. The euphoric high, you got to work pretty hard to get there though. You got to break sweat. I mean, uh, tennis, you know, so many kids have such poor technique. That's where the Spanish system, 50% tennis, 50% technique, fitness and technique to get kids to hit the ball. Well, okay. we got to slow down, grip, swing body, static balance. Um, but it's Rocky one, you got, you want to dance, you got to pay the band and it's, it's so many, the fun factor, let's have fun, 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 fun now, but you won't have fun later with, um, all these little nuggets, uh, the young coaches that we've worked with, ho hopefully, uh, I think some of them that are coaching college tennis teams, are they listening? And can you say it? Can you show it? You know, you got to live it. Um, all these, all these little pearls add up. Yeah. Give us another one. Let's go in twenties again. Uh, let's go 21. 21. I was already ready to say Peter Mahavlic, one of my favorite number 20, number 21, um, future versus past. Don't get stuck in the past, build and see your future so. self. Um, begin with the end in mind. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and again, it's, we can relate back to the phones in here. Um, if you show up and you, you know, kids would say, oh, I don't like running because you don't run. You see yourself, I'm bad at running. So you're stuck in the past. I'm bad at push-ups. You're not doing push-ups. So again, just build it up where you want to be a year from now. Again, we're going to come back. It's like somewhere we have numbers. If you don't have numbers, there's nothing to improve. Sometimes you'll meet the players like, uh, yeah, I want to be a player. I just came back from Nigeria. We can talk more about it. And, uh, you know, they're saying, well, playing all this ITFs and this and this. I'm like, okay, what is your mile time? ITFs, it eats traveling foolishly. It's yeah. a business. Mom and dad, there's five levels. Yeah. You know, one thing about the ITFs, come back to your point, but, you know, if a federation is paying for it, you know, why pay, play all these ITFs? Well, one is I want to play the majors. I want to play the junior Wimbledon, junior French. That's one thing that is taking place in this country. There's some major positives, the UTR money tournaments. I think you really can march to the beat of a drum, different drummer, but it, I'm telling you, people are spending so much money going to ITF tournaments and you just got to get better. And yeah, the stopwatch, I mean, it's just amazing. And it's okay. You know, what's your 20 you know, and also, I mean, what's your heart rate at rest? What's your recovery rate? I mean, not just in one minute, but what is it? like 20, 20 seconds where you have in between points. Like go, go on that a little bit more. Number 21. Yeah. Even the UTR, you know, we have so many young students, players who are stuck in the past. Okay. I'm 10 UTR. I'm not going to be playing anybody at nine UTR. So they stuck in the past. I'm 10. That's it. They don't see a future where, how, what should I do to be 12, 13, 14? They're just locked into this little number and they're trying to protect it. Just that it goes the same way if you cannot do a push up. You just know it's pain and it's like, I'm not strong. Yeah, with the UTR, it's, you know, give me some teenage lingo. It's sucking the life right out of people. With um, 
it's a ranking now because if it was just your 9, 10, or 11, but if it's 10.23, uh, 10.33, that's the problem. With, you know, I get all these messages, my phone, people doing this and that, and um, one and two and three. One is junior tennis, two is college tennis, and three is pro tennis. You know, so how many people go from um, junior tennis to pro tennis? Better yet, how many teenage sensations are are there? I think that our, our uh, advice for most, 98%, 99%, probably 90 99.5. You should be on the path to be a late bloomer. You know, Alcarez, teenage sensation. Um, with... You know, this young American, Alex Mickelson, doing so well, teenage sensation. Going back to Sharapova, um, a late bloomer, someone, you know, well, you know, 21 years old. I mean, someone goes from age 17 to age 21. Um, yeah, we also, too, say that when you go to college, you're either a, a project player or a blue chip. Like say so D1, I'll play D1, I'll play D1. Well, if you play D1, you're going to, at a high level, one of those power five conferences, you're going to be pretty close to being a D1, excuse me, a, a blue chip. It used to be, I believe, uh, 20 per class. Now it's 25 per class. Mm -hmm. um, kids don't play for the future. I mean, oh my word. This, people need to hear this over and over again. You and I have worked with so many players. It's been, as I said, almost 10 years. And, you know, misery. We could just cry over and over again about what young kids should have done and they didn't do. And, you know, how's, it, how's the phrase go? Um, you're not going to get what you deserve. You're going to get what you expect. But well, we know people that, uh, do you serve a volume when you play doubles? <laughs> no. Uh, do you go to the net? No. When's the last time you had an overhead of competition? I mean, it's just like, it should be just slapping them right across the head. Um, that's the biggest curse is people want to win now. Mm -hmm. but they, they really don't want to develop. Yeah. Uh, they do, but they don't. They, you know, and how many people really understand developing a tennis player? How many people really have developed a tennis player? How many tennis players um, have been taught and, you know, stayed within a system? It's amazing how... Um, how many successful coaches in the junior ranks, I could see in college for sure, but in the junior ranks, they're out recruiting. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're not taking someone from, uh, from a, a begin, beginning level on. Anything else on that one or you want to go on to another number? Well, I mean, just one more thing uh, with the future. Again, fail to plan is plan to fail. And numbers, again, where do you want to see, like I mentioned, where do you want to see yourself a year from now? And I know that sometimes we've been doing the math how many hours do you have to get a college? You know, the clock is ticking. That's your future. And, you know, give yourself a report, quarterly report. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually, it's a simple, simpler than it is. I mean, the students are trying to create it. It's complicated. It's simple, you know, especially going fitness trainers. No, just go run, go do push ups, go do sit ups. Of course, later on, when you get to some level, you can get the details, but. Yeah, don't kill the drill. I mean, so many kids. Uh, there needs to be a sense of urgency. I mean, with parents, I ask, is who, who's the bad cop? You can't have two good cops. The, the parents, you know, many people say, well, there's the balance. We've said that over and over again on these podcasts. Um, what happens typically is one parent cancels out the other. Mm -hmm. But the parents don't ever disagree um, in front of your child. Yeah, you can disagree afterwards, but you both have to, mom and dad, you both have to be on the same page. Um, you know, tennis is such an expensive sport. It's very difficult for a single parent to bring a child up. Um, you know, I think of the late Debbie DeHart spent a lot of time helping Debbie DeHart. So there are the exception of the rules of, you know, single parents that have brought up a tennis player. Um, but in some public school sports, one of the reasons that kids are so successful is just one parent, mm -hmm. just one messenger. Because, I mean, it's not going to work if the, the, the two parents uh, and opposites attract. So we go through all that, and then the kid's caught in the middle because the kid becomes a master manipulator, and they're just um, they're taking themselves down, down, down like the submarine. And that's exactly the future and past. It actually doesn't even go to a student. It goes to a parent as well. 
you'll still coach as well. Well, a lot of men, you know, yeah. the older they get, the better they were, the macho male ego. Yeah. 1,440 minutes a day and, um, yeah, sense of urgency. You know, you read about, you know, the basketball term is taking place now, men and women, the, um, the NCAA championships and practice is a sense of urgency, like water break, let's go, 30 seconds. The kids just want to sit down and chat. Mm -hmm. They want to sit down and chat. They have to be pushed. Um, push shouldn't come to, come to shove, but you need to have push. Yeah. You know. All right, go ahead. What do you got? Let's go number nine. Um, Maurice Richard, the rocket. Records, numbers, attendance, and punctuality. Attendance. Um, I could tell so many stories about attendance. Um, ran this academic program. When I went, moved to Tyler, Texas, I had been living in Southern California, so culture shock. And I was told uh, for every six absences, um, kids should be dropped from the class. So, I, But I didn't take attendance. So my ego is such where people are sleeping in and skipping my class. But then um, remember you know, Peter Burwash and Dennis Vandermeer initially having these very accomplished pros come to the campus. And... You know, they're sleeping in and they're missing class when, you know, great contributors to the game are on campus. So I got to the point where um, there was no such thing as a tardy. It used to be two tardies. What was recommended? Two tardies equal one absence. So I, the bell would ring, the door would shut. And I did that for throughout the 80s. And then I realized, okay, I'm going to move on to something else. And, and that, that was because I really wanted the administration to, um, I was the only full-time faculty member with students teaching students. There's a lot of pauses looking back, but attendance, you know, you know, Craig Tiley's name comes up quite a bit because he was with us for seven years and he's the CEO of Tennis to Australia and he had CEO skills back then. He was a very, very good off-court pro. And, you know, I wanted to know at the end of the year how many practices players missed. And I understand that with parents, especially with multiple children, can they can they be there on time? You know, I told a group of people the other day we're practicing at seven. So on Sunday morning we're gonna let you sleep in. We'll start practicing at seven o five, and it's like. Um, but why don't you comment on that? I, mean, I think it's so important to document. Um, at one point, um, we had a program called called Guinea Pigs, and um, very very successful within the state of Texas. And at the end of the year, we gave them a white hoodie and it just had um, the word go over their heart. And then on the sleeve, this is before homeschooling. And we never had a person at 1,000 hours, but they were all very close to, uh, to close, they were in the 900s, mm -hmm. how many hours they practiced. And, you know, we had a program where it was 100 plus. I think, how could you practice 100 plus hours? Well, Three hours after school, that's 15 hours. And then on Saturday, we would go seven hours on Saturday and three hours Sunday afternoon. It, it was, um, attendance was up to them, but we offered 100 hours of practice. Mm -hmm. And everybody could come at the same time, whether they're the beginner, whether they're really highly ranked. And, um, you know, we could make it work, make it work. Um, but go ahead, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, punctuality. Uh... Lombardi's time, if you're five minutes early, 10 minutes late, you know, I mean, it's a sense of emergency. It all starts from those little things, you know, how you wake up in the morning. Do you show up for today? Are you thinking about getting to be early? Sense of importance as well. I mean, no, we used to pick players up. I remember some parents going, well, I don't think we can do it. I go, no, because in Tyler, Texas, is not a very big town. I said, no, we'll pick them up. And we always practice before school. Um, with it's amazing how many young tennis players will come to practice and they haven't had breakfast yeah they just roll out of bed and you know the, the other thing if they most junior tennis players if they bring a snack mom or dad packed it and that's a problem yeah well that's why they stress out in the matches yeah no it's uh <laughs> the brain is not wired no it's uh it's it's not just being prepared for the match it's be, be, being prepared you know, days and days and days and days before. Um, with by the time it's match time, it's too late. 
Mm-hmm. And how, how again coming back to how you've been living your life? Uh, you know, those are the numbers. It's kind of like GPA, grade point average, and SAT, ACT. You know, jun- juniors need to know. Yeah, and the UTR now that it's a number, but how you're going to do the formula is the same. How you're going to do well in the classroom is you, you know I'm going to take the best notes. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to read, and it's it's all there. Yeah, numbers and then deep training numbers. How much? How much? I mean, you can be spending six hours in the practice, but how much time did you really practice? You show up in library, right, library six right, hours, and right? Then... You're, are you putting in time or are you putting in effort? Yeah, a lot of people are just putting in time. Empty, empty hours, empty hours. Yes, and and then it goes for again another thing: numbers. And here, just have numbers. Have a leaderboard. You know, with a group of friends, and then put a leaderboard once a month, mile time, everything. If you don't have those numbers, again, that's why you're going to be stuck in the past. When you have numbers, when you have records, there is something to improve. And that's why it's good when you're with a group of friends. That's like, yeah, this guy beats it. And you just keep going. You're pushing each other up instead of pushing each other down. Well, if the Great Base, we certainly had some compliments. It's a blueprint. It's um, it's on a silver platter. You just got to follow the directions. And very, very few do. Okay, give us another one of the 32. Uh, Let's go with again in twenties. Um, let's go. We, we didn't do twenty. We didn't do twenty. Uh twenty. There we go. Peter Mavlich, obedience, coachability, discipline, responsibility. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, in here you could just throw a lot of those words. I mean, um, obedience. We talked about it another day. You know, are you abiding the laws of physics? You know, um, coachability. Um, that's that's a big factor. We can talk about the Latvian tennis, how they pick kids in the program oh if they just would do a tryout that would be amazing but just pick the kids if you have limited spots just to coachability who's coachable um it's you have a future if you're coachable discipline i mean discipline responsibility goes and we touch base on all of those words already and you know dmp and um again punctuality numbers um but um yeah so um are you obedient? Are you coachable? Are you again a one time rule? Are you gonna do it? Are you in which part of the are you in, from the club that you have to be told a million times? Are you gonna do it once or are you gonna be Yeah, two do, yeah, two million time clubs. Do it a million times, be told a million times. It you know, children with their parents, you know, one time rule. They tell you once and you do it. Responsibility, the ability to respond. Uh James Dobson's book, uh Dare to Discipline, the effort in the reward chart. Um we had these two Russian trainers many years ago, husband, wife. They both were uh, European bodybuilding champions. And I said, come up with one word to define what you're going to do. And they said, oh, give, us, give me to tomorrow. And they came back with the word obedience. And you've already said that. Obey the laws of physics. Obey your goals. Obey your parents. Uh, they're for you, not against you. The Maria Sharapova thing. I figured out a long time ago, you know, Yuri, who's yelling at her, he was for me, not against me. Um, with, uh, tell us about Lafayette tennis. What number is that? Uh, 30. 30. 30. It's a uh, Gump Worsley, maybe. <laughs> go ahead. Yes, Latvian. There you go. I'm rocking the Latvian sweatshirt. Actually, this is from my brother when he went for the world championship with the hockey when he was, uh, working with a team with, the, uh, so that's from there. Uh, but Latvian tennis. My town, it's an interesting town. Uh, it looks like Olympic Village. I mean, they have amazing facilities. They have uh, seven beautiful red clay next to the sea. Ten minutes run. You have hard courts with a beautiful wall. And then I believe they have five indoor courts with a gym facility. And uh, with an indoor, I would call that place. It's like a little, it's almost look like a squash court. But it's really like they, they're practicing a little fitness. And I call it a skill development court. Where you can put eye coaches in there you can just really work on technique eliminate the tennis court just can really just break it down put it bikes upside down um but in latvian tennis it's still it's especially in our town that's the only one it's the only town in latvia that follows this system so far um it's still based on soviet system it's still a school they're taking kids every year when they when you start a school in september like a grade one when you're seven years old, you're getting into school, and that's when they're accepting new students into tennis. And after you graduate, 12th grade, you're getting a diploma that you finished the tennis school. But right now, what they can only offer is 
in the educating how to become a ref or they're giving you as you know i mean as, as, as i can as i'm from there i mean there's not not a lot of nuts and bolts about tennis um technique and but when they take a new student um when i was there in 2020 for each class there was 300 new students young students and they could only accept 100 and i was like wow this is amazing i mean you should guys with this facility should be producing players just from from the numbers but i asked how do you guys pick uh the players and they said well just basically out of the head picking, picking the name out of the head and i said why don't you guys run a tryout for a week you know see who's coachable again following those 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 words you know obedience coachability discipline responsibility who's hungry and just pick those kids you know it could be even athletic ability who can jump you know the german formula for hockey players who can jump higher we'll take those kids into a into a team um so while i was there i did uh, some workshops for the coaches introduce them to the great base um again it was it got accepted really well um but i was there with them only for three weeks as soon as i left everything fell apart so you really need to spend more time in there uh, we can talk more about remote coaching but it's like it's still not the same as uh install the culture in there uh, again we're talking talk about egos but then in, in the end do you really truly understand the system in and out i mean you really have to spend a lot of time around it um again everybody was in wow nobody you know they're all following those itf symposiums and workshops getting their point and i said nobody ever talked about the grips and how to get teach, uh, teach kids um, um so no i mean it was a uh, I, I worked with um there was like three players of um there were 12 turning to 14 a national um uh, national u12 and u14 team for latvia so three girls you know we filmed them strokes tiebreaker test and uh, actually they were doing the dmp as well and in three weeks it was amazing just to see their change i mean they're really athletic girls uh it's it was refreshing to see how they actually the kids are going to to a training facility on their bikes you know bicycles no parents just by themselves coming from school they're out there they train um and uh by the by the third week i mean with the form, with the correct form, to a beating tiebreaker test. I mean, that's that's a pretty impressive. Um, no, I remember seeing the films that you made. It was, um, were the girls were 11, 12 years old? No, they were 12 and 13. 12 and 13. 13 uh, yeah, yeah. yeah th that's where can people really see it. Um, you know, we've said it before, the, the FedEx logo. And coaching workshops, I've actually handed out a piece of paper with the FedEx logo. And you know, okay, take your pen and you know, can you can you find the X? And then once you see it, you always see it. But a lot of times, people just they simply don't see technique. They don't have they don't have the eye for it. It's like the line from the movie Moneyball. It's amazing how you can be a sport your whole life and know so little about it. With one thing, I, when you mentioned the bike upside down, um, we've got a, um, a video on our course, Tennis Intelligence Supply. It's late bloomer young guy, Orlean Stanoichev, where he went five sets with Kofelnikov. Um, but he's 19 years old, rebuilt his game. And we we put him in a garage with a tire upside down. So, okay, use your legs and lift from your thighs, your shoulders, and do this over and over again. Yeah. With uh, Richard Hernandez was on our podcast. And, you know, it's known Richard will be 40 years uh, next year. And... Um, done so many things with Richard. He started as a student, and he's asked what would be one word that would really improve tennis in, in Canada, and he said grips. Hmm. Three great tennis players, TFO, Fritz, and Tommy Paul. And we talked about it last week. Tommy Paul is great, how he's coming to the net, watching film of old players. It's not that they have wrong grips, but they could have more, more efficient grips. And yeah, it's, it's true that... Um, you know, the USPTA, the PTR, the governing bodies of tennis in this country, and I recommend that everybody in this country especially join and be proactive, be associated. Um, but it's almost like anything goes. Anything goes. Um, but with our program, what you're talking about really is people need to take a deep dive. Take a deep dive and, uh, you know, we need to, like everybody else, improve and say, okay, let's uh, 
make our content easier to navigate. Like say if your child's five years old and starting tennis, um, if people go through tennis intelligence applied, then they, they'll find out that no such thing as little strokes for little folks and high, low, high, grip of a lifetime. Uh, but I do think people think, well, what do you do with advanced players? You know, you just, you know, we go through specialty shots and basic shots and I should say emergency shots, obviously basic shots. Um, with Lafayette and tennis is to get, just like in any country, um, I don't think it's so much really um, the technical input, but the culture. Mm -hmm. you know, overall, what's the work ethic like? Like you, you mentioned you were just in Nigeria. Um, a kid's still a kid. The kid is the same, but the times have changed. You mentioned yeah. in Nigeria, still on the cell phones. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, um... What about what about Lafayette and tennis? What are, what's going on there? What you, you know? <laughs> If you had, had a wish for Lafayette and tennis, what would it be? Wish for Lafayette and tennis. Um, no, I mean, there's a lot of great things going for Lafayette and tennis. I mean, again, we just talked about sense of belonging. I mean, there's two players on the women's side, Sivastava and Ostapenko. Sivastava just came back again. She just had a kid and she's back playing Ostapenko. So it's, you know, the, the girls and Sivastava is from my town. So they have like a little tournament for her out there and she comes and visits so the kids can relate to her practice with her so it's just a great for them just to be around that uh gould is, is another player so it's possible so it's that the gates are open for left in tennis even our country is 1.8 million people right now probably even less if you're gonna go into numbers but uh um again the facilities i mean they're in europe it's part of eu they can travel um, but we can talk about this, uh, th 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 number, number three, that's going to be related to this, you know, without, again, I, I, I went in there and I just gave all the information, you know, greatbasetennis.com and educated them with grips, but in the end, I mean, they have a wall, they have amazing track, they have beach outside, there are water, clay courts, hard courts. Um, they even have the courts for the beach tennis, which is People would enjoy more beach tennis and pickleball tennis. Nothing in pickleball tennis, but I think beach tennis is a little bit more athletic. That will help tennis players a little bit better, a little bit uh, less fear jumping for the ball. Um, you know, there's soccer, and actually the tennis players in there, they're around other athletes. Again, I just mentioned that my, our town is like Olympic Village. I mean, there is a soccer. When you're running from the tennis court, there is a professional soccer club. There is a professional hockey club. There is a track uh a track right next to soccer so you round athletes it's a very athletic town actually Porzingis. i mean that's going to ring a bell to a lot of uh listeners Porzingis, he's from my town as well so he's donating money to the town as well building basketball courts so it opens up gates to a lot of younger basketball players like that's possible so just that um um does that um going back to the phones you know i didn't see that much on the phones I think just going back to the culture back then, I mean, there, but I don't see them just glued in. But at the same time, the kids that I worked with, I mean, they were more goal oriented uh, and going more after it. I mean, they were, I mean, I'm not saying, but they were there to work. So I didn't have to deal with them that they were in the middle of the workout, they're going and checking their phone. So Laf Lafayette Tennis, the uh, son of a billionaire, if, if they were to step up and uh, really help tennis, what the billionaire needs to do is make sure the money is run to improve education. Yeah. Um, we dedicated many podcasts to Vic Braden, the late Vic Braden. May 10th, 1976, Stone Ages. Vic, very humble guy. He basically said, if you give me eight average athletes and I could have them hit the ball this way and I could do it for 10 years, basically, they'd all be in the quarterfinals of Wimbledon. Yeah. You know, that's how bad you know is, is it improved some well yeah maybe the um forehand side where pe people are not all swinging at a ball with a continental grip but when he that when he made that comment um but if, if lafay has 1.8 million you know you and i were in memphis it was like okay let's go to memphis we'll help the underprivileged kids and it became political and it, it just did just didn't work out um but we were there 20 as a group. I, mean, I was there 21 months. You were there 24 months, but 1.8 million versus America. If we have, you know, th 330, so say 2 million versus uh, 2 million plus to round it up and 330 million plus to round it up. 
it's amazing how a small country like that could compete with the U.S. Yeah. And you're really, um, Dom Lausick brought that up. We're, we're 21 per capita. I'm sure that number fluctuates or has fluctuated. Um, but yeah, it's, it's amazing. You just, if you can get people to just hit the ball well. Yeah. Um, just get to hit the, you, you have to have skills. And it, it doesn't begin and end with ball striking, but uh, Braden used to say, I mean, uh, you want your uh, serve to be a bazooka gun or a, a pea shooter? Yeah. Um, what do you got? Well, just to improve, uh, let me finish up on this. Uh, you know, when I left with them, you know, of course, going in details. And again, I know that Great Basin Tennis and Challenge and Supplies had been um, said it's like a drinking water from the fire hose. You know, and if you don't spend enough time with somebody who can guide you through this, uh, people just sometimes get scared. Like, this is too much. But if you understand one plus one is two, two plus two is four. I mean, keep learning <laughs> the system. You know, it's like, you know, it's right. Well, you're going to be, you don't want to be stuck in a guesswork. But my suggestion would be in there. I mean, it's all there. If you're just going to have a wall training, just go to the wall, you know, hitting the ball against you. The wall is going to correct your compact swing if you're going to hit the ball hard. Um, tiebreaker set. Well, I think we'll go ahead to tiebreaker so I was going to, let me, I guess, go back. Sorry to interrupt. But the wall, just tracing the swing. If you just put the edge of the racket on the wall and go forward um, like you're going across the ironing board, tabletop. Keep the edge of the racket on the, the wall, the curtain, the fence. And just trace the swing, and then you're going to have a very short swing that's approximately 15 feet in length. Most kids have at least an extra six feet, mm -hmm. three in a centrifugal force going the wrong way. So, the, as you said earlier, the shape of the swing doesn't match the shape of the court. So it's just like, well, kid, um, it's unfortunate that uh, you know you don't have a streamlined forehand. Yeah, and then what 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 wins in the the early age groups? It's unfortunate that that's measured as success. Yeah. But go ahead, you're on uh, number three, tiebreaker test. Yeah, so if, just go hit a wall. Again, you have a wall drills. That's again, there is wall training, tiebreaker test, grips, and path of the racket and fitness. So if you just get those four parts, you have a better chance getting a, becoming a better tennis player. So if just those four parts in Latvian tennis and my town can adapt, they already have a much better chance creating more tennis players. Getting on the wall, having a path on the wall that you just mentioned, you know, there's so many different exercises on the wall. Tiebreak test, understand the targets. Can you hit the living room? Like four quadrants, you know? Yeah, you come up, you come up, you come up to the net, it's uh, 13 and a half by 21. We're gonna feed a ball to you underhand, 30 miles an hour. It's coming to your forehand volley and you can't hit it. Now the, the tiebreaker test, we have the skill test. Someone last week. You know, you helped me when uh, the young gal came in, she had some injuries and you're on man center to us and said, hey, she needs to change her technique. Number one reason for prevention of injury. Went approximately six months without playing points and you were filming the, or feeding. I said, well, this is a great way for Ilya to just we'll film it, you feed the ball to her. And, you know, you said to her afterwards, um, the, the serve, IP or plus, but after that, every shot was a minus. You played scared. And, but, you know, the, when people hear that, so how, how you do the drill is that, you, you know, you feed a ball and she's got, this girl had to hit, um, I mean, it, we're not talking about um, chopped liver. I mean, she's already, you know, gone up the ladder where she's represented her country and traveled around the world just in the 14th. And, I mean, that's the age she is right now. But hit, hit a cross-court forehand deep, hit a cross-court backhand deep. But then, then the situational training, you can change it up. Mm -hmm. She's not taking second serve and coming in. She's not serving and volleying. She's not playing a conventional approach volley. She's not, let's say, arcing a ball, pushing opponent back, and then bringing, hitting the drop shot as an imitation shot. Just young people don't play patterns. So when you, you know, add imagination to it. So you need to um, imitate before you innovate. Okay, here is the five, here are the five targets. You know, here's the information. Do you understand 19.1 degrees? Do you understand 130? Do you understand the dimensions of the court? And then you put the targets out, and then you can feed the ball. We always go, Mr. Hopman or Robert Lanzer, just feed the ball Mach 10. And, um, you know, eventually, like Braden would say, the umpire is going to say, ready, play. So it can't just be a, like, okay, we, we'll feed you the, we'll call it, break it down to a tiebreaker, break it down to a set. But, um, 
with, um, I think also you have under number three is fitness. Mm -hmm. Measure it. Anything that be, can be measured can be improved. Um, one thing we, I meant to say here earlier, one of the thoughts you had is jumping. Mm -hmm. You know, you measure, you can measure an athlete by how they jump. Yeah. And we, you know, we tell them, okay, minimum, minimum 12 minutes a day, skip rope, three minutes on, one minute off. And then yes or no, do you do the 12 minutes? And that's, you know, that, that's where all these things, the mom and dad have to be connected to this. And then, you know, you're paying for it. It's your kid's time. You're the one who's going to be taking your kid to tournaments and they're going to lose. Mm -hmm. And then also too, when you're taking them to tournaments, you have to realize that it's an international sport. College tennis is international. So it doesn't really matter. Well, yeah, my kid's really doing well in the U.S. of A. Well, that's that's a good start. Mm -hmm. That's a good start. But if you really you want to do well in college tennis, um, again, it's an international sport. But get the stopwatch out. Heart rate monitor we've talked about. Okay, give me another number. 32 thoughts. I like 18. 18? Let's go with 18. 18, Serge Savard. That guy was loose. What Serge Savard said about Bobby Orr, said in the NHL, we have stars, we have superstars, and we have Bobby Orr. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Yvonne put some photos up at our tennis house here. Eight bedrooms, eight bathrooms, but there's some hockey photos on the wall. And one is where I was on a college hockey team, but in the corner is a picture of myself with Bobby Orr. I was taken to meet Bobby Orr. I was 13. He was 19. He's 19. He's the best hockey player in the world. I mean, everybody, you know, maybe I mean, he was Bobby Orr. You know, maybe he wasn't like, I, I still think, I was probably at 19. Yeah, he was the best hockey player in the world. So Bobby Orr says to me, uh, hey, Stevie, did you bring your skates? I said, uh, no. He goes, oh, we'll skate next time. There, there was no next time. That'd be like somebody say, with Federer saying, some kid, some kid, you want to rally something? Oh, I don't have a racket. Yeah. But you don't borrow skates. You can borrow a racket. So Serge Savard, he was a great player. So playing piano, mastering increments, strokes and songs. I love that, you know. It's like these kids are just staying back and just hitting forehands. It's like you're a musician, but you only know one song. Yeah. Don't you want to learn a new song? But go ahead. Well, or even golfer's mentality, you know. You're just going to play the whole game of golf with a driver. You're going to be putting with a driver, you know. It's like you can break it down golf, you know, red zone, green zone, you know, yellow zone to putt. So, yeah, you, you, you got to master. Uh, you got to have to have tools. Um, then again, going back to piano, it's like... Again, understanding this, if you're learning how to play a song on the piano, you're not just teachers. You're not come, coming to take a lesson from a teacher and teacher plays a song in front of you and says, here, play this. No, it's like, how do you put fingers on the, on the, on the keys? How do you sit? Now this song breaks down in seven increments. Masters the first one. Then masters the second one. Masters the third one. Then when you master it, try to put it all together and then play it. So in a way, like you can think about it like a stroke, you know, forehand ground stroke. Ready position. Okay, what is the notes? Where are your toes? Where are your knees? Where are your grips? What is the angle of the racket face? Where are your elbows? Where is your head? Number two, you're turning for the forehand volley. Where is your racket? Backswing three, four, and so it goes till three, uh, three H balance of system, uh, three H system of balance, heel, hip, head. Um, so then you learn enough, that's your, your song, forehand ground stroke song. Um, and you're just going to be affluent in it. Just the language. And then, again, going about the piano, teaching tools. If you want to become a great piano player, you need to have a piano at home. So it's the same thing. If you want to become a great tennis player, you need to have your own piano, your own piano at home, backboard. Teaching port, tools. Port, portable backboard. Portable backboard, yeah. With, and all the teaching aids, and you got to use them. Yeah. You know, the portable backboard is like a, a domestic stationary bicycle. It becomes a clothes rack. People just put their clothes on it. So many stories. I have stories to tell. Family from Wisconsin, eight children. And I have to go back and check, but, um, you know, having children go on to play college tennis, even before that, uh, play, became high school state champions is many, many years ago, but, um, I remember telling them, uh, I mean, I know nothing about piano, but I said, all your kids play piano. I said, yeah. I said, well, no, we'd be any good. <laughs> and you know, the kids weren't that far apart. So eight kids. And I said, you got to get a second piano. I said, you got a basement. Put it, put it in, put it in the, put it in the basement. Get it, and they did. I says, well, if he, if one kid's going to be really good, he's going to want to practice all the time. Yeah. Eight, eight people can't share a piano. I mean, you have, it's like, no, no, we, we, you know, we, we have to get, have to get more practice time in. Um, 
Yeah, the golfer's mentality. Golfers don't want to hit the ball in the woods. Golfers don't want to hit the ball in the water. But the scoring system in golf, the you know tennis players, um, the scariest thing about tennis is, you know, and people are hear these on our podcast. When Crummy's playing Crummier, who wins? Crummy wins, but they don't know they're Crummy. Mm-hmm. And you know, Braden, he used to call everybody, include himself. Well, we toads, the late Bud Collins, Bud Collins he called everybody hacker. Two types of people: those who play Wimbledon and those who don't. But you're, you know, that's one great thing about the measuring tape or the stopwatch is you're being, you know, it's a true measurement. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the other thing too, I know I've coached tennis now for 50 years. And certainly I started off as a neophyte, like everybody, but, you know, the kids that are training, they're looking to their left, they're looking to the right. They, they just have a snapshot of what's, oh, this is, I'm being, comp- no, you're, you're telling us that you want to play college tennis. That's an international level. And you're looking left and you're looking right. And I know coaches say this all the time when one of their, one of their teams wins a championship, it's the teams that went before them as well. Mm-hmm. But with, um, yeah, that's where I, I do think a lot of players and parents struggle with, they, they always want to try to be on the court with better players. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're really good, you will, you will be on the court with better players. Virginia Wade, beautiful tennis. Yeah, I love that quote too. Virginia Wade. I think it's good for all people. If people are listening to this or passionate about tennis, is uh, winning t- tennis doesn't lead to beautiful tennis, but beautiful tennis leads to winning tennis. I mean, it's really sad. I mean, oh, you're playing doubles, but you serve and stay back. Oh, you know, no, I don't serve and stay back. I serve and run backwards. <laughs> I go to the fence. I don't go to the net. I mean, it is a crisis. Yeah. And you win that two inch trophy and. Um, you know, I think most pros, 100% would agree with this, 99.5, that if they could do over again, they would get better. Mm-hmm. I love to listen to Andy Roddy because I always have this podcast. What do you say about Roger Federer? He's an artist. He's a technician. I just get the crap out of the wall. <laughs> I mean, I have watched Roddick practice, and he's just yelling, my volleys suck. You know, he was inducted into the Tennis Hall of Fame, and – um Jim Curry was sitting behind him on the platform and he said, well, I feel good because Curry is behind me and using teenage lingo, but Roddick said his backhand sucked too. Um, you know, on his podcast, he talks about his backhand quite often. I mean, he didn't have a loop, didn't go high, low, high, and he went outside in, but he was a champion. You know, I, I think that Troy Aikman said it on this TV show, a documentary saw the Buffalo Bills. They were in the Super Bowl four times. And um, they lost all four, but Troy Aikman, who won two sort of Super Bowls, said that now he he thinks that the Bills, who won four, was greater than their effort in winning two, their accomplishment. I think the same thing with Roddick. If you get to three Wimbledon finals, I think three Wimbledon finals is better than one one U.S. Open. And I, you know, people call him a one slam wonder and to be slapped across the head. But um, I think you, that's another thing is just just to listen to the pros, mm-hmm. you know. He's interviewing Gilbert. Gilbert, does, he says, I don't do grips. So they ask Roddy, he goes, yeah, I'm from Nebraska. I don't, I don't do grips. <laughs> well, at the level they're coaching, they're coaching, um, you know, they're coaching players. You know, Roddick has now, you know, worked a little bit, not to say he's coaching, but he's worked with uh, Coco Goff. I'm sure we'll see him do more. He's a young guy. Um, but they're not doing grips. They're not, they're not out there with eight, eight year olds. Mm-hmm. Um, Let's go on. We got a few more. 32 thoughts. Let's go 13. 13. I don't think anyone's ever wore that number. I could be wrong. Montreal Canadiens. I'm wrong all the day long. No one from the past. I'm not, my passion is not as current for studying the Montreal Canadiens roster. Sharp, the acronym. Shadow, hit, aim, rally, and play. When you first told me this, I really like aim. Did a lot of clinics with John Vury. He used to help us out on the training tennis teachers on the business management side. And he say, used to say, he sold, sold, he designed and sold ball machines. If you want to hit it over there, aim it over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was his technique. But yeah. uh, shadow, hit, aim, rally, play. Talk to us about that. Yes. Um, again, like I mentioned, uh, you know, like when you 
getting a new students and you're going through this assessment, you know, you're recording their technique, seven shots, tiebreaker test, again, just a, um, the tool of persuasion, just to show it around. I mean, the meeting on the videos lasts like two and a half hours and some, some parents are like, oh my God, there's so much information, you know, and just, and, uh, just to simplify it, you know, the system, you know, just, so it's like, do you want your kid to have a sharp game? Your kid needs to have sharp strokes. You know, so this is the developmental pathway. First, let's go with the first letter S. Learn how to shadow swing. Understand the whole system. Again, we just talked about piano, metronome, master the shadow swing, just like a dance in front of the mirror. So basically after the, when you get the first letter S, it's, you know, there's online courses on greatbasetennis.com, Great Base Initiative, Building Blocks. Just learn that, pass the test. Then when you can demonstrate it, when you can already teach somebody, then let's go to hit. Can you hit a ball? Not even the tennis court, but I'm going to drop the ball. Can you hit the ball into the golf net, into the fence? But the same way you shadow swung. If you can do that, let's move up. But can you aim now? Can you aim the ball into a doubles alley? Now, can you aim the ball in a tiebreaker test? Can you hit the ball in a, in a box? Can you hit it consistently? And then after that, now you can add a little bit more footwork rally. Can you just rally consistently and move and put yourself in a position? You can hit the ball from, you know, hip high at the same time, recover and place the ball just on a dime for other player. Um, at the same time, can you hit pluses while you're rallying? Um, and then the last letter would be play. Can you now go and compete? Understanding the strategies, emotion, mental game. I mean, that's a sharp game. Sharp strokes, sharp layer, and that's, you get one, you get second, you get this, you get that. That comes back to brain memory. It comes back to, are you sharp or are you dull? And people are not, they just choose to not be switched on. And that means dull, lights on, nobody's home. One thing with that, uh, people who make a quick glance at what we do, oh, no racket hit speed, old school, too mechanical, too slow. And they, they do, they, all they do is shadow swing. All they do is hit on the cone. Well, first impressions are everlasting. And, um, you know, today, going back to political correctness, you can't tell someone they're an idiot. You idiot. You say, well, I think your behavior is being idiotic. You can't just say, you idiot. You can't hit the target. If you can't hit the target, you can't play. Um, with. But as you said, it's just the beginning. Just the beginning. Um, most players are getting better at getting worse. You know, granted, the characters we see on TV, you know, it's amazing how people persevere to a really high level and they have holes in their game. That just lets you know, physical specimen, mental warrior. Um, we lose too many people in tennis because not that it's not burnout, it's frustration factor. Mm -hmm. They're practicing hour after hour and they're not getting better. Yeah. Okay, 32 thoughts. Give me another one. Let's go 23. 23, Bob Gainey. Some say the best two-way hockey player. Multiple sports. Now, the alpha generation here in the States, more and more families are just having one child. Uh, that's a factor. Uh, Bjorn Borg, he did okay, so you could be only child. But, oh no, I mean, tennis players, for the most part, cannot throw a ball. Mm -hmm. You know, even though they're pretty proficient, you know, you take some kid who's 11 on the UTR, most likely they can't throw. American kid, they come around and they are right here and they have the shot put. I mean, they don't have the supination, the arm at a 90 degree angle, that thumb down, the thumb down, the snap, because they haven't thrown a ball. Mm -hmm. If you haven't thrown a ball, you haven't thrown a ball. Uh, with, you know, I grew up at a time where it was very unfair for women, but everybody could play baseball. World War II, the Americans were doing okay throwing uh, grenades. Mm -hmm. The Germans put, put it on an 80-inch rod and went, whoops. Um, but yeah, 23 with playing sports. Go ahead, other sports. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I believe, again, Soviet system. I think it's Eastern European system. Everybody did gymnastics, body awareness. Yeah. It's like every kid just needs to have gymnastics. If you're, even if your kid later on is not going to pick sports and going to be more into arts, Still is going to help. But if your kid is speaking to be in sports for the rest of your life, gymnastics, two years, one to two years, get it, get a body awareness. After this, I mean, multi sport, track and field, just they need to learn how to run. They need to 
you know, uh, team sports, any team sport, soccer, footwork, basketball, hand-eye coordination, um, hockey or American football, just for the, just for the, um, what do you say, the, my English, my Russian and my Latvian cannot think of the word. <laughs> Sometimes forget which word, which language I'm thinking on. Um, what, just run it by me again? Uh, you know, just, just, just to pick for American football and ice hockey, just for roughness and toughness, especially for the boys. Before well, the age yeah, of 12. Well, yeah. Uh, collision, contact, non-contact. Yeah. My father used to say about football, they, they, they line up like mountain goats. Yeah. In hockey, lacrosse, you can learn to avoid the check. Football, no way. I mean, I love football. I think every boy should play football at least through the Pop Warner age. You know, put the helmet on, get the mouth guard, and tackle. Yeah. I mean, with, uh, no, it's true about gymnastics, body awareness. Um, I spent a lot of time in Moscow and large tennis facilities. One court is just all equipment mm -hmm. becoming an athlete. Yeah. 7,200 square feet of, you know, it looks like they're training uh, gymnasts. Central Europe, Northern Europe, every kid can ski, skate, play soccer. Um, it's so important. You think about being on a pair of skis like this kid's center, Federer. Mm -hmm. Novak Djokovic's parents ran a restaurant at the bottom of a ski hill. Every impulse you can wipe out. Um, you mentioned earlier the Germans, what they did is they went to kindergartens. That's a German word. That's part of American societies. They, before first grade, you go to kindergarten. And they've really improved in ice hockey. And what they did is they just found people who could jump. I mean, they would test, say, well, that kid can jump. And they started, you know, offering uh, free training with, um, you know, for someone to go through a PE class years ago, you would at least know how the wrestlers trained. Mm -hmm. The wrestlers are wearing rubber suits and they're trying to lose weight. But just how the wrestlers would go up and down those ropes. Yeah. And I can remember being, you know, just told time after time, hey, you hockey players, you're not too tough. Let's see you do this. Let's see you do this. And the way the wrestlers were working is like, oh, my word. But I think just the exposure to other sports. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we just this week we had baseball gloves, we had our footballs, we had soccer balls. And, you know, it's like with doubles, we say, you know, why don't you do this? Every junior program, at least, I mean, 20 minutes would be nice. Everybody's going to play one bounce doubles. You need to be partner doubles, serve and go for it. And they do it at a young age. I feel so sorry for college coaches. I mean, by the time they get eight, an 18 year old, I figure they start at age eight if they're good enough to play college tennis. They play 10 years of doubles the wrong way. Yeah. 100%. Not, not 99.5. <laughs> I mean, I, I think 100%. But multiple sports. Um, when the sports are too structured. And when I was a kid, only soccer, someone would have anything to do with it to be six weeks of PE class, you play soccer. It was played th throughout New England. Um, by the time I went to prep school in the seventies and then it was played in St. Louis, but it was, you know, it's a relatively still a new sport. We were very fortunate in the U S that we had so many people to come here to train. I heard Nick Saban say the last Olympics, 83% of the medal winners had trained at an American university. So, um, no, kids don't have savvy. My father used to say I had no savvy. I had the brains that God gave little green apples. But, um, you know, junior players don't know how to lob. They're trying to hit topspin winners from everywhere. They don't know when they're in trouble. They don't know how to take the role of the spoiler. But if they played other sports, you know, as far as just dealing with time and space and, um, you know, just playing the game we call lightning ball which is basically ultimate frisbee with tennis ball. Kids love it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a coach here from England, a very good soccer player, Lawrence Hyde. He was on the podcast helping out. Oh, no, I'm not the best soccer player. It hurts my feelings. Actually, I think a guest we <laughs> no, had. that's a, a joke, though. Um, yeah, well, let me say, let me, well, yeah, let me say this about Ilya. Is that we trained, we had a little place in Florida, at, at least one, definitely, definitely one full-scale soccer field. And people tell you that you were the best and you go, I don't even play soccer. <laughs> but actually a, a kid we had on, a great kid, uh, Fergus O'Rourke, 
he played. He's really fast. And he only played with his left foot. He goes, I haven't played tennis. I haven't played soccer since I was 12. But the tennis kids playing against him, they thought, they thought he was a superstar. Yeah. I've done this many times with European and South Americans. Is Say there is, we got a group of 18 people and there's five in total, five uh, foreigners, you know, from Europe or South America. They go, you five go down there and it's five versus 13. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I was in South Africa. I was just, it kind of threw me by surprise. And uh, I was just asked, you know, why is women's soccer so good in your country? And, you know, they have won the World Cup, right? So um, numbers and sunshine and facility. But it's, it's again, it's, it's a relatively new sport when you say it's really only about 50 years old in the U.S. Mm -hmm. in, in the U.S., I've been told by soccer experts that kids only play if it's structured. Where places I've been, it's just instant soccer. Yeah. The kids have had a three-hour practice, and they're, the courts are being used by someone else. They're, they're, their practice is over, and they're playing, a, they're playing a soccer game. Even if they don't have a soccer ball, they're playing with a rolled-up so pair of socks. I mean, yeah. Okay, we're winding down here. What else you got? Oh, we got a few more here. Yeah, let's go with 28. 28. I love the word character. Character technique equals tactics. What do you got? Again, before you're teaching technique, you've got to teach character. Before you teach tactic, you have to teach technique. There is no tactics without technique. Well, and so, I, think, I think also you have to be a character. I mean, um, you you have to be a little schizophrenic if you're going to coach, you know, um, with, uh, I remember working with a young guy, Simon Rogers, great guy. And I said, Hey, Simon, there was a girl, Jackie white. I just remember things. And I said, Hey, tell Jackie, she's got to, uh, shorten the backswing on her forehand. And he started to walk towards her training his other teachers. But I said, no, 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 you got to yell it out from here. <laughs> you know, you'll hear this in training. Well, use, use a, um, if you're being critical, use a private voice. If you're, if you're not being critical, you're being positive, you can use it, a mm -hmm. group voice. And it's like, no, that's diplomacy. <laughs> that just kills time. You know, just tell them now, you know, just tell them now. Well, go ahead make a few comments on that. Yes. I mean, it's, um, that goes back to already touched upon on this, you know, obedience, could you be able to discipline? Uh, um, yeah. Character. Um, if you're not willing, first of all, it's actually, as I would even say, it's love for the sport. Um, you know, if you don't have love for the sport, I mean, there is, it's, of course, makes it job for the coach much tougher. But if you have a love for the sport, you'll do anything and everything to improve. You know, like motivation, the hockey NHL players don't need motivation. Their motivation is extra zero on the back of their salary. Um, but, um, but their character, again, going back to planning, going back to, um, you know, just the respect to the craft, um, character at the same time, you can build your character. You can build your mental strength through the running. So it's kind of like chicken or the egg, you know, go, go run 5k. How many, how many players are actually doing in running 5k? That will, that will toughen you up a little bit. Um, if you can run at once a month, 5k, you'll have a little bit longer mental, um, all the tennis players, I mean, three miles is not a long run. And yeah. so many fitness trainers say, well, your sport is fast twitch. Your sport is anaerobic. I mean, running builds character. Yeah. You, you should go for at least one long run a week. And it depends on the age group. But I mean, three miles is not a long run. That's what we meet players that never run 5K at all. I mean, it's yeah. what the percentage would be. Um, no, if you get American kids don't realize you're going to go to Europe and train, take running shoes with you. Yeah. With uh, Dumb and Dumber, the movie, I guess there's Dumb and Dumber 2. Uh, I've told many times to people, well, that's a dumb lesson, but it's even dumber that people are paying for it. With um, your mentality, the coach, it's like the other day when you told the girl, you're scared. And after the serve, every ball was a minus. And uh, she was in the room, her parents are in the room. And I said, I just love that. That's just golden. Yeah, is golden, and you know. But it, um, I think what happens here in the U.S. is same in Canada. Might as well pick on Mexico as well. The, the the softest kids in North America are the rich Mexicans. You know, they grow up with a cook in the house, and I've coached a lot of rich Mexicans. But with um, yeah, I can remember being at Bradens and a group of Mexican kids that I was teaching uh, at 
they had gone to the bar, not to drink, but they had gone to the mm -hmm. the restaurant. And I remember picking up hundred dollar bills as I went to the restaurant. Wow. Uh, they're falling out of their pocket, but um, yeah, the mentality the it's it's a, it's a the it's just the opposite. And some of the players I could name easily a half dozen. A little time, give me a dozen. I name a dozen players that should have worked with you, but their mentality, and that's what parents want. They want the coach's mentality to come down to the kid's mentality. Mm -hmm. It's 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 backwards. It's yeah. so messed up. You know the the the, uh, the military term. I mean, I won't tell you what the F stands for, but FUBAR. Yeah, it's effed up beyond all recognition, or effed up beyond all repair. Yeah, that's that's tennis coaching. That's another positive thought for the. Memory bank. So give us, give us another one. What do you got? Let's go twenty-five. Twenty-five. Jacques Lemaire. I remember winning a pool when Jacques Lemaire. I said, said he is. I don't know. There's like thirteen people in the room. Okay, everybody, put a buck in. Who's going to score? I go Jacques Lemaire. I can't remember how old he was, but Jacques Lemaire scored. That guy could play both ways so fast. Coming back to it, he was a really good skater. He has a breakaway. Bobby or he just zooms down, takes the puck away from him. Back to back to tennis, pure teaching. You know, I would say within hockey, that doesn't happen in tennis where um, older kids pull younger kids along. You know, there's a leadership. It's it's not the smoothest, but it's like, hey, you're not going to act that way. And, yeah. and, you know, you're out there, and if you don't act a certain way, you're going to get an elbow. What are your thoughts on pure teaching? Yeah, uh, information transfer, the fastest rate of learning or information Retention, my English here, is teaching. Um, you know, big brother, big sister. Again, you just mentioned. I mean, it's uh, one of the programs with that we are we're trying to uh, apply in in Florida, and that was was part of it. Like peer teaching, big brother, big sister program, where one older kid would just have five, six kids under him or under her, um, and that just creates culture. We would want to have like you know captains practice. Like not even have coaches involved, just kids regulate kids. No, Monday you practice with coaches. Tuesday, Thursday, sorry, you just with your big brother, big sister. Go do it. And of course, coaches would be around the tennis courts, looking over five, six courts just to see what's going on. Everything's okay, but just let them run the practice. It's great for um, um, the the older kids who are teaching, and it'll be great for younger kids because kids relate to kids. Um, and they could be even competing against each other. You know, who's the best coach? You know, who's the best student? And I mean, they, now you have a competitive culture. Um, and at the same time, I mean, younger students could take younger. I mean, we have this great kid who's coming in uh, Monday. I'll tell him all the time, you're a better teacher than you're a player. Why don't you teach yourself? Like, you're teaching so well. He's an amazing piano player as well. Oh, so okay. Yeah, yeah, great kid. With um, Aiden, I remember uh, first time I... I uh, used a whistle as a peewee hockey player, outdoor rink, captain, running the practice. And in hockey, you were, your pants, you could take the thigh pads out, and uh, but that's where I kept the whistle. You just take the glove out, you pull out the whistle. And, um, with, it's very powerful. It, it doubles the learning. It's two-way street. and But you have to have information. Yeah. You know, the thing is that the expression, you can't fool a kid, once they have comparative experience, and the problem, though, is we get stuck on, it's like we get stuck in the third grade. You know, we're still teaching kids, well, you have to have a two-part swing on the forehand. You got to swing away from your body. You have to allow a hitting zone. And they just get stuck on that um, because they don't, like you said, the piano at home, they don't do the practice at home. You got to practice before practice and after practice. So you have to do more. Yeah. Okay, another thought, 32 thoughts. Let's go eight. Number eight. Dickie Duff. All right. The Russian formula, early start, driven parents, powerful, consistent coaching, cultural toughness. Dan Nicole's book. Um, that's a, that, definitely a book that, um, you know, it's not a matter of reading the book. You got to live the book. In other words, okay, if you don't have an early start, we did this with a kid the other day on the, on the bulletin board. His parents were, the whiteboard, his parents were in the room. Okay, he had a fairly early start, you know, didn't start at five, started at eight. Um, driven parent doesn't mean crazy parent. Well, if they've got them up here in the mountains. They got them here. 
Powerful, consistent coaching. That's what's lacking here in the U.S. So, but he's had that. So he has a early start. That's a plus one. He's driven parents. That's a plus two. Powerful, consistent coaching. That's a plus three. But he lives in the U.S.A. He's in a tennis world. That's a minus one. That's one good thing about Moscow. You get the rich Russians, but you can't tell. Affluenza. That um, they they work hard. They work hard. Um, with um, what do you got on the Daniel Coyle's Russian formula? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I can relate to, to Latvia with this. I mean, you can go, and it's, and it's again just a guideline, you know, chances of you becoming a better tennis player. That would have, they all would have early start. They're all starting at six. Um, they have, for the most part, driven parents. I mean, they, there is a mentality in there in Latvia. You need to get out of here and go travel the world or go play college in the United States. So there is that plan and the parents are driven to get uh, um, succeed the best and again going back I remember you know Soviet Union um, everything was for free and but if you are not following the agenda you're kicked out I got kicked out from musical school I got <laughs> kicked out from uh, gymnastics by my I got kicked out from soccer I got kicked out from soccer by my dad when I was six or five I got kicked out from my gymnastics by my father's sister <laughs> and then uh, by music, by cheating. So um, so that they have early start. So it's, there's a culture of toughness as well. Um, so there's like early start plus one, culture of toughness plus one, during plus, plus three, but powerful, consistent coaching. Well, that's, I mean, there's, again, you talk and talk about just a powerful, I and mean, there's a lot of yelling <laughs> with the coaches out there, but there's no information. Um, I think that's where the word teaching comes in. There's lots yeah. of, there's, to me, there's lots of great coaches, but there's not a lot of great teachers because they don't have information. Yeah. So I think that's uh, teaching that's nuts and bolts, but I would say there's powerful, consistent coaching in there. Um, coaches in there, they're driven. But, you know, coming back to being kicked out East West, I mean, uh, we got a lovely kid here right now. Fun. He's a fun kid, but you know, in the Soviet system, he would be kicked out. He'd be at the factory by now. And, uh, <laughs> But what happens here in the West is we cater to the paycheck. You know, if the kid can pay, they can stay. But um, yeah, it's not. It's it's unfortunate that um, there's there's not standards. Mm -hmm. You know, with um, I do think some of that certainly happens in education where they mainstream a kid and they just push him along. Um, there's there's tournaments for everyone. I mean. Uh, yeah. You can continue to play tournaments. And the thing is, is that uh, everybody, not everybody, almost everybody, they get to a certain level and that's it. They're just stuck. Yeah. That's how they're going to play forever. They're going to get bigger and stronger and they're going to get better at being mediocre. But their skill set is there's a ceiling on how good they'll be. Yeah. Okay. Moving along. Thoughts. Let's follow up. Ilya from... Baby, what do you got? Uh, number. Next number, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Let's follow up. Was 24. 24. Mickey Redman. Okay. Um, pay for tennis with your work ethic. I like it. Go ahead. Yeah. This is again, it just, it's, this one should start in the perfect world. A billion dollar check. <laughs> um, you know, again, you just mentioned you know, in the East and the West. Um, and again, you have to. You have to earn money. You have to put a food on your plate. Um, again, overhead if you're owning the club. But in the perfect world, it would be great if the kid would earn its spot. Tennis would be free. It would be just a pure sport. But great base. Months. Great base is free. Yes, but <laughs> and and exactly. So that's the information is out there. But um, you, you get to the third grade. Okay, I'll just, let's say three months, grade one. I just say you have to learn how to shadow swing. You have to make notes from your assessment video. You have to finish your grade based intelligence course, three months. Did you pass that? Good. Let's move on. Next three months. Let's say you have to go through another course, uh, building blocks. Um, do you have teaching tools at home? Now, let's film you. Can you hit a ball? I'm going back to the sharp. Shadow swing, hit, aim, rally, play. 
Now, can you hit the ball the way you were shadow swinging? Okay, you pass the second grade. Let's go next three months. Or let's go next six months. Let's just say third grade is going to be six months. In the six months, all right, can you hit a tiebreaker test and win it? But we can even break it down, tiebreaker test, in two parts. Not six shots in a row, but let's say, can you hit three shots in a row? Volley, volley, overhead. Can you beat tiebreaker test with three shots? And then can you hit ground stroke cross court, ground stroke cross court, approach shot down the line deep? Can you beat that? That could be a first level tiebreaker test. Um, if you pass that, good. You you finished uh, another course on greatbasetennis.com, like how to practice at home. You, you, you're sending the DMP every day. So you 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 just you know on a, on a, your numbers are written down for you. you then, know? It, then if not, you're out. <laughs> no, if not, I mean that could be less forgiving. But let's just say if it's if the, your first attempt, it's free. But if you didn't do it the first time, you're still in the group, you're still training, but you have to pay twenty five percent. That could be oh. that could be a um, that could be just a, a show the fee. How much does it cost to play a month? Let's say you know a month that would be a thousand or two thousand, whatever, just a number from the sky. But because you applied for it first time, you're following through, you're going for free. But if you failed the test, if you failed what are you what are you supposed to do, now you have to pay 25% of that fee. If you failed it again, now you have to pay 50% from that fee and goes on. And that way, I mean, you right away putting parent, involving parents, no, you practicing today. You doing DMP, no, you spending an hour today on, on, on the backboard because that makes sense, you know? So you're putting parents to work with a kid as well. So you're building that culture. And again, if the kid does not want to follow the instruction, I mean, okay, there's going to be this program. It's still the same information, but it's not going to be that stressed. I mean, you, you're paying, you coming in two times a week or whatever it is. And it's just more, you could say it like a rack tennis, goal oriented tennis, rack tennis. I mean, there's a different ways to, to, to put it, but you're just doing this way. Maybe you're doing something else besides tennis. Maybe you're playing soccer and just taking tennis lessons, but you're still getting the right information. But in your goal-oriented school where you're doing it free, it's like improvement. And I mean, we can get to the part where, you know, like, let's say when you're competing, where is, are you improving? We can measure, like, is your improvement, like, are you improving 3% three, three a month or 1% a month? Are you showing improvement? then you're, you're keeping your scholarship. But if you're not showing improvement, sorry. Like not even including a ranking out there. Are you improving your beauty test score? Are you improving your miles? Are you improving, you know, go, let's go to the wall. Can you hit 250 shots in a row that the ball has to bounce over the net and pass the service line? Can you hit 250 shots like this? What is your record? How many sh shots can you hit in a row in a, in a target on, top, on the wall, three by three, you know, six feet over the net. How many can you hit in a row? I mean, there could be so many different, again, imagination is great as the knowledge how to set up that system, but it's like, are you really working? And you're setting up goals that you can control. I mean, matches you cannot really control in the way of winning a tournament, a ranking. I mean, UTR and ranking will take care of you, but if you can set up goals that you can control, I mean, you can control beep test if you're practicing. In three months, I'm getting there. Nobody's stopping you. It's only you, it's your competition. So. Again, just in the perfect world, I think it would be great that tennis would be paid with a work ethic. And it doesn't matter what your financial background is. I mean, everybody's accepted. And of course, the people who can afford it, they can just donate to the program. People who cannot afford it, okay, go work. Nobody is pushed away. I mean, it's just open. It's out there for you. Um, and then that way you build, it, it's, it's becoming a culture. Everybody's just going after it. Um, so yeah, perfect world. Um, and no, there, there has to be a way for people that have figured out where it could be a win, win, win. You think of an owner who's got, you know, the burden, the challenge of paying for indoor court time, heat and light, 7,200 square feet per court. Um, I, I've heard this a similar conversation so many different times, like one of the martial arts, Taekwondo, take your dough. It used to, it used to be, there was a black belt and a brown belt. And now, I mean, there's a, a blue belt and a blue belt with white stripes and it just it's like it's like the rainbow uh, so many things you said come to my mind there was a t tennis teacher i should be able to tell you tell you her name but um peaches barkalkowitz became a world-class tennis player she was and there was other really good players and the pe teacher basically said you can stay in the gym hit against the wall or you go outside and run on the track the pe teacher really loved tennis um i think work ethic where are they doing the extras 
And, you know, I, I think also too, to have it be work study where, you know, if they're giving back to the program as well, um, measurements, um, you know, I think one of the best things to do is, you know, um, someone's going to become mentally or t mentally, mentally tough if they're physically tough. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to run, get the, you, you have to do this. Braden used to say about the, the blue Jays, the Robins and the sparrows for reading groups. Everybody knows what their group is, is no, you can't, cannot move up. Um, you know, we've worked with players together where, you know, say someone is, uh, the best player in the group mm -hmm. or they're the best, um, you know, the girl, best girl in the group, best young player in the group, but they're not the best when they hit the track and they run. They, well, they just rationalize in their own mind. Well, I'm the best tennis player here, so I don't have to push it when I run. Uh, but yeah, there should, there should be cutoffs with, but it would, um, you know, just, you know, a lot of people say, well, the freedom, you know, they say, well, you know, the Soviet system, there's no perfect system in the, in the West, we've catered towards money. In the East, they've catered towards talent. And they both have their downfalls. The one catering towards talent doesn't give people a second chance. But college tennis, for example, I tell kids this all the time. Um, do you want to have your, say we get a kid where the coach gives them a guaranteed spot. They're not going to get cut from the team. Do you want to uh, be sitting in the bleachers when your parents come to visit? Mm -hmm. and, and in ice hockey, at least you'd be sitting up in the press box. But with um so are you gonna be good enough well there's 12 people on the team but they only travel with eight they have three coaches but all three coaches go with the eight and do you travel so you, you want to get to the point where you can at least make the travel trip but then you go and you don't even play yeah and then 85 percent of players who don't play as a freshman give or take they don't play and um so i tell people that, that i think that's actually okay i get it um but I just think many times they look to their left, look to your right. And you've already said it here is that, you know, can they have a vision for the future? Can they have a vision for the yeah. future. Um, I, you know, the word scholarship, I really, I like the idea that they can get to the point where they can be a, a contributor. So it's more of a student assistantship, but no, it, it's something, you know, could be really creative to run a championship culture. But the way it's going right now is we're losing people in tennis because capitalism is not perfect. And it's, you know, it's almost like, you know, every time Dick and Harry wants a hundred dollars for an hour lesson, and it really comes down to their competency level. It's, you know, they're, uh, they're an imposter and, you know, have they ever really taught well, because they, they hit the ball a little bit, but, um, yeah, let's keep going here. Let's go with 19. Yeah. Perry Harper principles versus feelings. Yes, principle versus feelings. I mean, we were listening to those uh, motivational tapes here. A uh, couple, couple mornings we listened to them. Um, how does it go? In the end of every feeling, there is no promise. Or I'm getting it wrong. After, but in the beginning of every principle, in the end of every principle, there is a promise. In the end of every feeling, there is. You got uh, me. Yeah, I, 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 I <laughs> forgot this, but yeah. So, so in the end of the principles. Uh, it's almost like I'm going to those three rules, uh, be different, do the opposite of what you want to do, you know. Um, I, mean, I, li I like the spin off and the facts don't have feelings. Don't let your feelings get in the way. Yeah. No one's going to tell you to feel on your feet. You got to think on your feet. Um, yeah. You, you mean, you, you've, Chuck Creasy, I've heard him say this for years, great guy. He called me up the other day just to talk about you know, he's a guardian of the game and it's just so sad what, what's going on with tennis. And, um, Chuck Creasy, do you, so many things do you want to stand out or you want to fit in. Um, you know, no one, no one's bigger than the game with, um, but with you know, feeling feelings versus facts. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just amazing with, um, principles if you this is another chuck chris if you don't stand for something you'll fall for anything yeah and come on but, but a lot of times you know um people really haven't um they, they don't they're not knowledgeable enough to stand for something in, in, in our corner of the world in tennis teaching okay let's go to another one well not just, yeah sorry I mean, sorry if you got go, principle-based tennis i mean that's just a whole honesty that's just a little honesty no 
little you, honesty. You need yeah. a lot of honesty. Yeah, a lot of honesty. It's like, go, no, you've been told, go play like I've been told, principle based. But then yeah. if you have that honesty, you're going to be free. But if you're lying to yourself and you're relying on those feelings, that's when you're going to be more jammed up. You know, that's where I'm, I'm just trying to win. I'm just trying to win that little trophy. It's that little trophy is going to put you in a bigger emotional jail later on. Emotional jail. I like it <laughs> with, uh, but yeah, the, the language from our corner of the world, uh, it's form teaching and game-based coaching should be combined. And it's called principle mm -hmm. teaching. And you can be clever if you if you know technique you can say okay we're gonna have a form tournament okay we're gonna you know we'll do this and keep score and you're rewarding kids for their efforts to uh develop good technique yeah we're almost done here <laughs> okay give me another one let's go let's go number four oh that's john bellavo player development pathways the pyramid versus stocking I'm not sure what you mean by stocking. Well, I'll stock it. It's going to maybe my English. Um, developing you, you, want to, you, want, you want to just switch to Russian now? Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> Go ahead. <so. laughs> it's, this podcast is going to be for Ivan Ozretz. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, no, the pyramid. I mean, um, sometimes, you know, the, the I don't want to use a great bass player. When you're using a great bass player, it's like people with information, students with information. When they're developing, sometimes the critique comes, well, they're not developing that fast. You know, they're so mechanical. You know, Big Brain uh, quote, you know, they'll loosen up after the winning. Nationals. The yeah. Nationals, you know, they're mechanical because they're working mechanics. But the information, again, I mentioned before, sometimes when you're mentioning this whole, um, you know, great base intelligence, uh, tennis, great base intelligence applied 24 plus hour course, so much information and people get scared away from it but again if you're building the blocks let's just say if you're building pyramid you have to create a base so i'm putting one block here let's say technique you're working on this and another block strategy another block this and you're building a wide base versus somebody just stacking one block on top of another block and if you're going to look the height of it they're going much higher so they can be beating somebody who is establishing a wider base you know, when the players are competing in the matches, they have so many things to think about. They're not playing free in the beginning. And again, we're telling students, you know, you go into restaurants, take a piece of paper and start drawing a tennis court with the seven concepts, emotional anchors, you know, uh, developing a tennis mind that you're charting. So there is so much stuff. I mean, you're learning a language. Um, I wouldn't even say, I mean, you're learning, you know, technical language, tactical language, but it all comes together. Um, so when you're establishing it, but when you're building it up, but by stacking one block on top of each other, one top of another block, it just becomes unstable and it has a ceiling. You cannot build too high when you're just stacking simply, but okay. you can progress much higher. But when you're building a pyramid, maybe you're progressing slower, but it's stable ground. You're not going to fall down below that level. So let's just say pyramid, the first block of only one block is on top. It's like six levels up. You can think about UTRs. That's good, yeah, I like that. And then from here, from a six UTR, you can be building up whatever up, and that's when you exceed where other blocks are just keep falling down all the time. They're trying to rebuild it. And I mean, you can brainstorm it even more. Maybe somebody has uh, square blocks, somebody has like broken blocks, <laughs> you know, just like relating to the body. You know, somebody takes longer to build it up. Uh, but if somebody has a strong block in the beginning, they can come up. So it's just, just like a little um, um, explanation to the parents how, again, player development works and it needs time and you don't judge the unfinished project and just do, and, you know, uh, if the parent wants to be involved in learning, that's great. Um, um, the information, they need to know the information so you can see the pathway. Um, yeah, no, they I have to be aware of that. Building blocks. Yeah. Um, Logical sequential order. Uh, let's do this. Uh, Jacques Lepetier, number two. Uh, Actually, I coached a girl from Montreal, and she'd get really nervous, and I would just go up to the fence, and I would just repeat these names of French-Canadian hockey players. Yvonne Conway, Jacques Lepetier. <laughs> uh, and I can remember, uh, you know, to say four or five and really fast, and someone said to me steve i didn't know you could speak french i said yeah i speak french. Yeah, i speak french so but the girl it was amazing it, it, it was a tactic it loosened the gal, the gal up and she uh had some good results uh number two number two close 
Control, open skills, pie chart. I like the pie chart. People need to understand that. Go ahead. Yeah, um, again, just for the parents uh, to understand the pie chart of training. Um, so close, controlled, and open skill. So basically, it's like uh, less improvisation, more improvisation. So close skill, when not a lot of things can go wrong. So you can relate to close skill training. That could be just basically shadow swinging, using the wall training, where you're tracking out the ball on the wall, um, net training, not involving a tennis ball at all. Um, I got, um, we have those eye coaches. I just, you're just forming, I'm just working on the form. So nothing can go wrong. You are completely switched on and just really building your form. Um, controlled skill. Um, I mean, it's going to depend on each player where they are in a progression and a pathway. So for example, somebody can hit the ball, just even hand feeding, that could be a controlled. They can hit the ball, aiming for the ball. Tiebreaker test could be a controlled skill. Uh, for some players who, who progress, could be uh, the drills that we do, where they're playing a seven ball drill. They serve, they return, approach at volley and overhead. You know, some players were just beginning, and that would be open skill. Everything's going to go wrong. But if somebody who has already, uh, and then open skill, I mean, that's basically, uh, you can relate to like, you know, rat tat tat just coming at, at each other and a lot of things could go wrong. You're just playing it out, playing points. That could be open skill. Playing on the on the wall where you're serving and volleying on the wall, you know, you have to adjust. And again, every player is going to have their own understanding what's uh, controlled and open skill is, depending on the level. Um, and then you can put into this pie chart a fitness as well. And how do you really design a practice? So for example, you have four hours of practice. So if you're a developing player, I mean, let's just break it down in four. 50% would be, you can put it like, you know, controlled skill. Um, one third of it would be closed skill. Uh, one third of it would be um, fitness. And another one third would be closed skill. Um, that's again, it's just going versus construction, destruction, you know, it's more fun to go and hit balls. And for the most part, as the kids are going on the court without supervision, what's going to happen on the pie chart. And even sometimes with the parents, they want to see their kids hitting balls. You're going to see 80% of the time is what open skill. And then after really, it's more destruction than construction. So Ilya speaks three languages, as we said, so myself speaking one. Translating, <laughs> no, 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 I, I say that in a positive way that from uh, when you talk about the pie chart in, in, in different levels, but when you say rat-a-tat-tat, that's Vic Braden's favorite drill. What that is, is one player at the baseline, another player at the baseline, you feed underhand and you just go right at each other, hitting volleys and try to make the other person look like a donut. So that, that's my, my translation on the rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. Oh. <laughs> that, that, that could be Russian, Latvian, <laughs> or English. All, or, all three in the one. Rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. <laughs> the pie chart, people people have to understand, you know, parents, kids, coaches, that um, you definitely have to overload technique in the beginning. Yeah. But that's where, you know, parents are paying for, you know, very expensive fees and they should be taught tennis. I mean, a kid can go out and, you know, kick a soccer ball and do so many things, become an athlete on their own. But if the coach is a technician, if they can actually teach tennis in the beginning, that that pie graph is uh, a big dose if it goes to skill acquisition. Yeah. Um, and, go ahead. Yeah, and it's it's again, if you're training on your own, it's great to have that percentage break it down because sometimes you do stare away, just like, oh, let's just go hit balls. I'm just going to some older students that, you know, and training on their own. I mean, what is your pie chart of training? Fitness, open skill, close skill. Where do you stand? I mean, did you create it? Again, plan to uh, fail to plan is a plan to fail. The numbers again. So if you don't have that, I mean, of course, before the before the tournament, the pie chart, you know, that will be more open skill, you know. No, I, I, met, the end. I met with a dad today who's visiting from Singapore and, and told him, hey, this is what the, the garage needs to look like, the basement, the spare room. That... It's really sad if a kid has to come out and keep doing the same drills that they could do on their own. Yeah. So they have the expertise of the coach. Um, it's just, it'd be like someone, as you mentioned earlier, they're taking piano and they're not practicing. I think everyone who's taught tennis, technical tennis, the, the child comes back and you might, you could just have a tape recorder and just push it again. Okay. Let's do the same thing again because, yeah. because they're not practicing at home. Um, 
How about number five? That's interesting to me. Developing, I heard you talk about this, uh, the development of a competitive league for younger players like baseball, tennis, um, you know, just double hits, you know, hitting in the alley. Go ahead and comment on that if you want. Yeah, it's just uh, to have a developmental league. I know um, um, it would be great for players 10 and under, even 12 and under, uh, beginning players, instead of them focusing on the little trophies, UTRs. I mean, it's amazing how many people are so stressed about are you three UTR, four UTR. I'm dealing with a lot of young kids and parents. Some parents just stressed out four or five or three. No, no, it's development. Let's develop skills. Uh, and if there'll be a league where you come in and what is a baseball tennis? You know, one player is throwing without a racket, another player is with a racket. Uh, of course, they have to be like a little rep observing if a person with a with a ball who's catching is not allowed to run with the ball. You know, they have to be like some eth ethics involved. But with a baseball tennis, I mean, the ball is not coming fast. They're understanding the strategy. The rallies are longer. The balls are actually, the kids are going to be hitting more balls. Um, you're understanding that when you doing baseball tennis you have to be throwing the ball deep you cannot throw it short well but even with baseball tennis to get it going say you're on the court with six people no rackets they just catch and throw or just that yeah and then you could take you know players you can have so many players on a court and they have people behind them they're just they're just doing the fence drills on tracing the swing yeah. because again uh and today with the telephones kids can't really catch and throw um but another term for baseball tennis this is a human ball machine mm -hmm. Two seven-year-olds really should, you know, only one has a tennis racket. The other one, they, they catch, they throw, as you said, it slows it down. You know, they're becoming an athlete. They're judging the ball. They're catching the ball. They're working on the service motion and eye coordination. And they're learning strategy because you have to be able to have defense and, you know, the, the rally yeah. um, with... Um, so what I call it, as a, as a, sorry, got you off. I was going to, no, no, I was just going to say years ago for K-Swiss, uh, they had adult leagues and they had junior tennis leagues and then I remember designing it, it never done so many things that never really surfaced but for k swiss i uh wrote out you know you just say take an idea like the decathlon 10 events and um for really young kids but you do it on a tennis court then you know shadow swinging and that type of thing comes into it but you have contests related to them becoming a tennis player and you make it competitive yeah. But when you look at kids playing tennis, like when we teach doubles, it's throw, catch, hot potato. It's, you know, the, the, the ones, one side, two players, they don't have a racket. And the other side, eventually they have a racket, but you catch, toss, and everything's tossed to the forehand, mm -hmm. the forehand volley. Everybody's coming in. Now everybody's catching, tossing the backhand volley. And, uh, you know, we don't really uh, toot our own horn, but we've had all sorts of people become really good doubles players. Um but the way doubles is taught, it's like, are you kidding me? This isn't doubles. Yeah. You know, kids are, um, the uh, young gal that we spent a lot of time working with her, Coach Cole Reeves. I mean, she, uh, Lannis Hamilton has had some success playing doubles. And, you know, she's like my son who had some success playing doubles. She just knows where to stand. Yeah. She'd go to a tournament. She's, you know, maybe the only one who's serving going to the net. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, I mean, go ahead. Um, just following up on this, like, you know, development, com developmental competing league. So, it's at, I mean, of course, it would be tough to do something on UTR level or USTA level. But, uh, you know, in-house ladder for, this, for all the students who are under 12, you come in on the weekend and this is what we're we doing. We're doing a baseball, baseball tennis tournament. Or, yeah, it then really comes down to you right. have to have uh, great group dynamic skills and salesmanship yeah. skills to pull it off. And... Uh, that's where coming back to what you were talking about um, trying to make tennis less costly that the older players who can contribute and help make it work. And yeah. it's not like you know, the typical thing in, in tennis is, okay, we got one ball basket and we got one ball feeder. Mm -hmm. You know, that's in the next court, next court. There's, is, there's not a lot of creativity. Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea to have a league that, that Billie Jean King has pushed that forever, finding ways to get you know, players on a team. But a team where they're learning skills and, and, and again to be creative where there's skills for score yeah you know? and especially with the double hits you can put somebody who is much weaker player and you can let them hit with double hits so basically you're making them a ferrari they can get to every ball and they're not gonna miss yeah another person on the other side they can really somebody could be a much higher level playing against the kid who is not that great you know uh with double hits so that way it's everybody can join it's not really 
putting, you know, somebody who is 14 cannot play with somebody who is 11. No, 11 year old be able to play with 14. Just do double hits, and both of them will get a great uh, s- developmental s- skills. Um, well, that's good for our hockey listeners. Uh, number five is Boom Boom Jeffrey on. He uh, gave him credit for inventing the slap shot. I was once in a tournament and uh, played against his son. Number 14, information versus inspiration. Yes, information versus inspiration. Uh, again, YouTube. Um, don't watch pros for information. Watch pros for information. Say, say that again. Don't watch the pros for in- information. Right. Watch the pros for inspiration. Be inspired by pros. Um, and again, just a little circle example. I, I borrowed it from Michael Arshai. I know that he is uh, talking about the great base. You just. I love this. Yeah. T- uh, type an A, the new cursive, and then it's a signature. Um, and I do this little uh, trick with the students as well. I let them. Uh, I'm like, okay, go. Let's everybody draw, draw five circles. Just best circles you can draw. All of them have to be similar. Then I tell them, okay, perfect. Now let's go. Now we're competing. Picture we're going to a tournament of circle drawing. We have five seconds. Who's going to draw the most circles? And the best looking circles wins. And, you know, I say, okay, ready, set, go. Everybody draws. And, of course, all the circles don't look as great as they practiced to do it perfectly. Everybody has a little imperfection. Everybody have all the different imperfections. And then I say, okay, now you guys are going to be inspired. Pictures that I'm Djokovic of circle drawing. <laughs> and you guys watching me. And I say right away. So I start drawing very quickly circles. Of course, I'm not the best circle drawer, but I'm saying this is the best as there is in the world right now. <laughs> and, and after this, you know, I have like seven circles drawn. And I'm saying, okay, now you pick one that you like the most with all the inf- imperfections in there. And just go back right now and start drawing 10 circles. The same way, just pick mine and just try to replicate it. The same circle with all my imperfections. So they go and they're drawing those 10 circles with all those imperfections and they struggle. You know, it's much tougher than to draw a simple circle, basic circle. And I say, now we're going to go to competition. Five seconds, try to draw the circles that you've been practicing of my circle with yeah. all those imperfections. Go. So they start drawing those circles and the circles don't even look like circles anymore. They look like butts. So that's how I relate. So when you're trying to, when you're looking at the pros, they're still drawing the circles. They have a little imperfections. But if you don't know the, 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 the information, if you don't know the foundation, like, you know, you're building a house, what's most important is foundation. Nobody sees foundation. But if you don't see the circle and you're focusing on all those little things and then you go home and you practice those little imperfections and you try to go to compete, this is what's going to happen. Your circle is going to look like butts. Yeah, no, I like that. So it's that. inspiration, information. So I like the expression that no one sees the foundation. The story of the three little pigs is you're going to build your tennis game out of straw, or you're going to build your tennis, tennis game out of brick, brick by brick. Keep, a bad, keep away the big bad wolf. Yeah. Um, number 26, attracting more players. That's a huge <laughs> thought. More players to the sport of tennis through baseball tennis, soccer tennis. Uh, I know we're going to work on putting together a, a fundraiser where we uh, can travel and, and have this 10 day, 10 hour program and you know, like a tennis marathon. And you know, so people can find sponsors and that'll be a way for us to uh, try to keep the great, we'll try to improve the great base. Basically, we're going to keep the great base going, but try to improve it. But why don't you comment on the number 26? Yeah, it's just a out of the box idea. Um, and again, it's, it could be done through, um, uh, uh, fundraising uh, events, for example, baseball tennis. I mean, would it be amazing to contact a high school team in your in your town, invite the baseball team, and say, okay, baseball team, we're gonna raise some money. So baseball team, come to our club, come to our courts, and play against our tennis players, just like what we explained about. So baseball players are only gonna throw, tennis players are only gonna use rackets. So you have now all the baseball players, you have all the parents, you have. Now their families coming and you have the brothers and sisters. So you're just getting other people who are not exposed to the tennis, just doing those events as a fundraiser. I mean, and the baseball team can raise some money. Tennis player can raise, raise some money and through the baseball teams. I mean, you can invite a couple of them, you know, so it's, 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 you can invite some tennis teams from the school too. So it could be, you can pack. I'm just thinking about UC with hundred courts invite all the baseball players, all the tennis players, and just let's go. <laughs> With uh, some of our students who have been university coaches, college coaches, pull that off. You're much more accurate with your hands. So someone just catching the ball, throwing the ball, who's at the same level, 
of athleticism is going to beat the person with the racket. You're much more accurate with your hands. Um, not too long ago, we were at NC State. Across the street from the tennis court is um, the men's baseball field, and they have a lot, number of people gone big time. But in, recently, I watched um, the NC, NC State men play. Shout out to Joe Way, and uh, I sent him a note today. It was no ordinary Joe. Great to see you play. Congratulations, you're playing, uh, you know, in a, for a Power Five conference school. But you know, the baseball players could rock rock over to the tennis facility. The baseball players are going to win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it still would be a fun stuff. I mean. But they throw their arm out, so you you don't want to uh, do too much of it. Uh, I mean, my son Connor would take the racket low on the backhand side. You, know, you want to have speed, counter speed, have the racket up high. But one of the fellow tennis players. Uh, I've done this a number of times, but his older brother played uh, baseball in the ACC, and he go, "Hey, just just throw twenty, just throw 20. Mm -hmm. just rifle it in." I mean, to really see a baseball player throw a ball, it's it's spectacular. Yeah. Um, let's go with number twenty nine. Now, let me go with this with number twenty nine. Soccer I, tennis? No. You want to talk about soccer tennis? Yeah, yeah. yeah go for it. I think it. that'll be fun too. I mean, it's another uh, you know soccer tennis, especially pickleballs. Pickleball, pickleball, pickle courts, and wedding tennis courts. This is a great pickleball court. It's actually amazing for tennis soccer. It's a perfect dimension to play tennis soccer. And again, inviting a soccer teams, you know, again, Messi phenomenal right now. Everybody wants to play soccer. And, you know, pink. You get many tennis it. nets, many soccer nets. I mean, yeah. I mean, you have on or two tennis, you on two, two tennis courts, you can put. Let me get close. On two tennis courts, you can put six pickleball tennis, six people, six pickleball courts. So that's. Multiply by six by four is 24. So you have 24 people. It's basically two soccer teams. They're playing tennis soccer. And then you can put some tennis players out there. Okay, we have tennis courts. So let's run a soccer tennis tournament. Soccer players would love that. That's working on skills. That would be amazing. And now you have it again through the fundraiser. Let's get the soccer teams in, in town. If you have tennis courts open. Again, I'm thinking USTA. I mean, it's amazing. Or, uh, Orlando City, actually, the head coach of Orlando City is my neighbor. Like okay, let's let's get all this developmental league UCA. Let's let's get the soccer things. Let's involve more athletes and bring more athletes from other sports that we're not exposed to tennis. So and then you're dealing now with the soccer players. You're dealing with their you know their siblings and you know you're exposed to more. So again, just out of the box ideas to kind of to promote the sport. And, well, those uh, out of by out of box ideas. I mean, I've mentioned many times. This is appropriate time to repeat it. I feel like I've to be an athletic director now. I'm not talking about the the organizational office stuff with all the paperwork and so much behind that. But you know, in elementary school, I mean, our kids learning as you said already, catch, throw. Are they learning basic skills? But um, you know, you'll hear many times. Well, in the United States, we're not attracting the athletes. Mm -hmm. No, there's plenty of people playing tennis, but overall, they're not really well taught. Uh, I know a coach who. Uh, Years ago, he had a chance to teach when, when he, when he um, I think it was Billy Olson. He had the world's record in the pole vault. And, mm -hmm. and it was just said, well, he didn't take to tennis. Tennis wasn't good. It, it, tennis wasn't his sport. But if someone was that athletic, that, that some people might say that's the most challenging thing to do. To uh, You have to be fast to go get the speed going. And you have to be so agile acrobatic to get up over that bar. I mean, it's really tough. You gotta be a complete athlete to be a pole vaulter. And I, it's just amazing that, uh, you know, when people pick up tennis for the first time, they, you know, like if people pick up a football, they're going to be pretty close to how to hang on to it. Mm -hmm. People dribbling a basketball, it'd be pretty close. Okay. A soccer ball. Okay. They're going to learn to quickly go from their toe to their instep. But you know, tennis people, they don't know how to hang on the racket. Yeah. So you, 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 it'd be great to have, uh, It'll late to even little kids, you know, okay, little kids, why, you know, choose some tennis, choose tennis, but they need to know the pathway. Yeah. And the one thing about the great base is the pathway shouldn't be so expensive. Yeah. You know, if it, it's grip, swing body, ready position, unit turn, circular swing, circular spin. Um, let's wrap this thing up here pretty quick. Uh, we got three to go. I know I, the, the numbers, uh, I might have this wrong, but I still think one was Rogie Vashon, 29 Ken Dryden, 30 Gump Worsley. We're down to 29, so that would be Ken Dryden. Um, used to watch him play college hockey for Cornell. Nigeria, what do you got? Ball boys, problem with phones. 
the work yeah. the workshop you just conducted. Yes, I just came back uh, from Nigeria, I believe two three weeks ago. Um, just uh, how to alter inspire. Just went to work with some of the students that you know um, that they moved from Texas. Now they're living in Nigeria, um, and um, they struggle a little bit with uh, with the coach. And coach is actually learning as a system. I mean, again, the next number is remote online training. Um, well, one is there's information line. Two is like are you really studying it, and three are you really practicing it. Um, and uh, so I went in there just to show and do the workshops for the for the coaches yeah. that working with the students. Uh, it was a actually it was a main coach, assistant coach, and then they have those two or three hitting hitting uh, hitting coaches. They actually the ex ball ball girls and ball boys that come in there to their court. Um, and um, it's, so it's, it's it's differently when you actually to showing showing them information. So I did some workshops at the country club where the students are from. Again, Nigeria. It's like uh, the tennis club, the country club that was from the place where the girls was uh, if without traffic, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. But in traffic, I think one day it took us three hours to get to a place. It's a crazy place out there. Um, so with the workshop again, I worked with a lot of the with the ball boys, and it's amazing just showing them, you know, the the, the country club that was in there is it was great. There was a wall, there was a basketball court, there was a soccer clay courts, hard courts. Um, again, minus is ball boys. I mean, the culture in there. It's um, you see those ball ball boys and ball girls are just picking up balls for all the um, um, members of the club, and it's not even adults, but just like juniors who are members of the club, they're hitting balls, and there's some kids who are the same age coming up and picking up balls for them. It's a little disturbing to to see in there. Um, but again, we talked about it, you know, those ball boys and ball girls are most athletic kids out of all of them, but no information. So that was, uh, it was great, you know, to show and share things, even just like we mentioned before, just if you're just going to understand the tiebreaker test, hit the wall, and I showed you how to have, hang onto the racket, I showed you how to do the drills on the wall, and just continue doing fitness, you have a better chance of becoming a better tennis player. Um, but again, there's a one big minus. I mean, this country is a third world country. Oof, it's um, it's 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 struggling, and especially in the last year, their currency I think quadrupled. Last year, the Nigerian naira was one dollar to four hundred. This year, it's like one dollar to sixteen hundred. So everyone's struggling. But at the same time, nobody's hungry. But again, I was just exposed to one country club, and and the girls that I coached that are from U.S. But um, you know, you're trying to get through them, okay, so there's possibilities for you to do this, learn the system, it's free, it's online, but, you know, the first, I would say, first three, four days, everybody was excited, you know, somebody's coming from U.S., and they're almost like wedding gifts from you, in a way, they're all around you, they're learning, they're trying to present themselves in the best way, but then when it's going to work, you're just kind of seeing, it's like you're losing their interest, um, and then you start recognizing that most of the time, they're just sitting on the phones, even in the, the countries that they barely can afford, you know, I'm not like bread and bottle of water, you know, they'll have phones though. They're free. <laughs> and they're all on the phones, Instagrams and out there. So again, we talked about the past and the future. It's it's like you're trying to tell them you can have a great future in tennis. There are so many different avenues in, in tennis, but it's uh they're all they're kind of stuck in this bubble. Again, exposure. It's like in kids in America, you're telling them, Hey, you have everything great for you. You know, you talk about happy and uh, successful. It's your, it's you're playing tennis. You know, there are some kids who are struggling for food in Africa. Kids in here, you tell them they don't see that they cannot relate to it. So the same, the kids in Africa, they cannot relate. Like you can have those opportunities out here for them. It's just like you're speaking a different language. It's not real. So uh, it's, it's almost like you have to bring them. It's like, this is possible. <laughs> Take the phones away. In the history of tennis, uh, it's a, so many stories. I think of Manuel Arantes. Um, many champions were ball kids, you know, they were, they were paid, you know, it's very tough to see kids picking balls up for kids, but kids picking up for seniors and you know, being paid very, very, very little, but just being around tennis and watching the game and with no instruction, you know, Rante's, uh, I remember him beating Connors at, uh, Wimbledon great, great, excuse me, at the U.S. Open, at the U.S. Open, um, with, um, Nigeria is there a governing body of tennis? There is, but there is so much corruption. 
I know that I met with the director of the club and they actually formed their own association. It uh, was a tennis parent or players association. And they're starting to run a lot of UTR events. And as soon as they start getting some success in the area, Nigerian Tennis Federation reached out to them and it's like, are you going to give us some money? <laughs> so it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of corruption uh, in this. And, and it looked like that and in there, everybody's for themselves. Um, so, and we talked about some projects that could be great for Nigeria, you know, like even that country club that I, that I, that I just mentioned, you know, installing a great base system. And they, they, they saw that it works. They, they see the potential. They see the, um, the information that had never been exposed. I mean, they're having all those ITF training and all of this, sending coaches to train. But when they see this, what I showed them in those two weeks in there, they're like, they were in, wow, that would be great. But of course, there have to be there sometimes. Uh, there have to be somebody there full time who knows the system to create the culture. Uh, that's why it's going to go to a remote to online training. I mean, it's like they were asking me that they wanted me to film the best six players in 14 and under that's coming up in April and six coaches and educate them online. And I said, well, I mean, picture if you need a surgery, are you going to call a doctor? You know, if you need to perform a surgery online, I mean, yeah. it's going to help you. I'm going to give you some suggestions, but it's not going to, you're not going to solve the problem. Somebody needs to be there. Or you need to come and spend some time with us. Of course, it's much cheaper if somebody goes there and trains them. Um, you know, I think with remote coaching, uh, it's like too many people got to the point where they weren't out on the court, like the tennis teachers of the past, like a Braden and a Vandermeer, a Van Horn, or it's a consultation fee. And, you know, they're sitting in a room like this with air conditioning. You know, yeah, we're going to teach you how to hit a ball. You, you got to get on the court. You got yeah. to pound some nails. With um, Yeah, I want to go back to one thing. Uh, Mike Larshide, uh, love how it broke down the great base. You First you print, and then it's, you mentioned this, then it's cursive, then it's a signature. And he says it's an injustice to just start with a signature. And that's where you, you, you mentioned just going to YouTube and watching people hit balls. I do think there's a lesson. I remember the first time I was in Surabaya, Indonesia. I was with Danny Cooper. And after the first day, I said, Cooper, I know this might be a little bit rude, but with, we're going to stay here for lunch and we're going to teach the ball kids. I mean, there was kids that they were rolling up the nets and sleeping on the nets. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, yeah, I think, you know, biblical teaching, the more you have, the less you have. But this has been great. We got one more. And uh, this could go forever. So let's make this one. Uh, you and I can certainly uh, so mention certain. short. We can mention short and sweet, but uh, let's not keep it sweet. I think sometimes I'm accused of not making it sweet. Projects. You wrote down projects. Uh, always circle down 31 remote training, online training. Well, okay. You go that remote training. I think you, you, you just touched upon that. Go yeah, ahead, say, more, say more about it. Yeah. Yeah. Remote online training. I mean, there's definitely a plus. Is if you've been exposed one-on-one, how to do things. I think it's great. I well, mean, with the great a base is remote training. <laughs> is, and, yeah. I, and I know firsthand that I, I talk to people on the phone. I just know they know because yeah. they, they've taken a deep dive in their things they're saying. They've listened to these podcasts. Yeah. These podcasts, well, I mean, we're not Joe Rogan and Andy, Andy uh, Roddick has jumped ahead of us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Re yeah, remote. remote training. And I mean, there are so many stories that uh, some parents who are without coaches are doing that. But again, they, they came and visited you. That's 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 important part that needs to be in there. I think you're going to be missing some pieces and bits of pieces if you don't see it. Yeah, a young boy from Arkansas is now is moving to Texas. Uh, they've done 5,000 hours, and they were first introduced to tennis through uh, Cole Reese. But you know, he came to this young young man, uh, Yuvon. He came to spend time with us. Uh, uh, he's got passion, and he's mm -hmm. putting the time in. And you can you can learn tennis anywhere, and that's where. Um, that's what the great base is about, but I, I think with, uh, you know, what we're doing as far as remote training is we're not telling somebody, okay, you know, send me some film and we'll, you know, we, we, you know, there's some people, that's all they do. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're not, they're not on the court. They, they, perhaps they were in the past, but they're just doing, they're just a video coach. No. And, um, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, I just I just think that you know it's unfortunate that um, you got to get on. The, let me just say you got to get on the court. Yeah. You, you can do remote training. You can help your kids via video. Use technology. Yes, yes, yes. But you have to get on the court. So I agree with what you're saying. Is that you know you, 
be best for you to go back to Nigeria and, or have them step it up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's just end with projects. Uh, 32 thoughts. I mean, wow. Projects. Yeah. To me, I, I just like the word. I tell people, don't use the word job. Say it's a project. I'm building something. Mm -hmm. you know? And one is you never work for anyone else. You always work for yourself. You're building yourself. What's your thoughts with number 32? Number 32. Projects. I don't, I, don't, I don't know who we're on number 32 for the Montreal Canadiens. Back in, the, back in the day when I was crazy, no one would. It, the number just didn't go above 30. Mm. No, projects, again, just mentioned Nigeria project. Um, again, one of them, it's, uh, and I know that in the past, that even in the United States, in online schools, they wanted to put Great Base as an after-school program. It's like a project, you know, after-school. So there is a school in, in a Nigeria, a private school, just to put the curriculum of Great Base in your school. And I, I met with the owner of a private school. He really liked it, the idea of this. They can make it as a subject in there. Which is, yeah, I know you mentioned to me that that would be a great project. Yeah. And that type of thing, if, if someone made a deep dive and went, you know, okay, the grip stickers mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, can someone even explain the grips? And then, you know, okay, then we always say grip police. Let's check the grips. And then do they have the ideas on how to, okay, take a ball and rub it up against the wall? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to have people maintain that grip. Um, yeah, so, no, that would be great if people were to do that. Um, you know, it, it has taken place. It's taken place, you know. I mean, I go back to, uh, um, I remember Vic Diamond many, many years ago, you know, in a high school on a rainy day, he'd go into a computer lab. They say he's got 22 people on his team and they're all sitting at a computer and they you know, they don't have a gym to use, but they're, they're, they're looking at a clip mm -hmm. and then they go out in the hallway. They go back in they watch another clip um so yeah i mean if, if people were to switch on and go okay how can i make this work and then ingenuity put some thought into it yeah yeah anything else yeah I mean, projects latvian project working with federations i mean that's the same thing going for even nigerian tennis federation project and they're just working with some teams and coaches you know i mean um that's a, that's a, it's a fun work, but it's like, it needs continu continuity. Well, a federation, a club, if, if the person at the top, uh, somebody I have to talk to this upcoming week owns a tennis club, calls me up and, you know, people, if they take a deep dive, look at her content. And, and, and I've been told this, uh, um, with competency, you know, we're one of the only outfits that shows young kids on video clips hitting the ball better and show progression mm -hmm. um but if the person at the chat whoever's in charge um then, then it would work yeah. you know um camps clubs federations yeah. um if the boss says this is the way we're doing it we're all we're going to all agree um that there's eight sides to a tennis racket we're all going to agree that um you know, there's not a right or wrong way, but efficiency. We're going to have people that have low toss, the right hand, low tosses out to the right with the palm down motion. Mm -hmm. We're going to, you know, we're going to have that be common denominators instead of having kids play for years at every level of tennis, even kids that are cherry picked by federations mm -hmm. um, or people recruited by college tennis teams. They don't have a very uh, efficient service motion. Yeah. And, you know, then, okay, we have to deal with the problem. We're going to work within that player's game. Um, but I guess I would say so many different thoughts. One to end with is there's no substitute for a good beginning. So a school like that, you know, if, you know if someone is five, six years old, mm -hmm. teach them how to run properly, teach them to throw and catch, you know, get rid of the cell phones yeah. and, you know, golf is a four letter word, but just, te <sighs> just, just teasing, but. If someone knows the Welby Van Horn body balance, three H system balance, they're going to be on their way to hit a golf ball fairly well. Mm -hmm. That you know, the grip comes into it, the swing comes into it. But listeners, uh, thanks for hanging in there. This this uh, podcast is a project, <laughs> and we're going to improve this podcast because we're going to go back and eventually get around to show notes and taking ex excerpts from this. But uh, listeners, thanks for listening, and Ilya. 
No, thank you for having me. This yeah, great. yeah, no, it's a great review. And uh, you speak four languages, that's for sure. You speak uh, tennis backwards, forwards, and upside down, sport development, athleticism. All right, wave goodbye to the camera in Lafayette. All right. Adios, amigos. Thanks for listening. Paca, paca.